What is up, everybody? Welcome to the first ever weekly Ask Me Anything. This is a new segment we've put together, and we're going to start having them every Thursday afternoon. Uh, we're starting right now at 3 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll go to about 5.30. The plan is to do this every Thursday, so long as it's not a holiday, and uh, give you guys a chance to literally ask me anything. Now, it could be uh, fence-related questions. It could be business questions. Really, anything that's on your mind, go ahead and drop it in the comments below. I'd love to be as much help as I can to you guys. Also, I've got a few questions up on the board. We had uh, we had some folks in the community tab. We had, we made a post just saying, hey, we're coming live to you on Thursday. If you can't make it, drop your questions in the comments below. And we've got a few of those. Also, I had an email from, uh, from Mark Knudsen uh, just concerning some import materials, product liability. So we're going to bring that up. Uh, also later on in the broadcast, but first and foremost, how are you guys? Hope everybody's doing super well. There's uh, right now there's about eight of you in here. So why don't we do this? Why don't you guys say hi? That way I know who's here. Cause it tells me how many people are here, but it doesn't tell me who's watching. Now I'd sure like a chance to say hi to you guys. Uh, also what I think would be fun is to let us know where you are. Uh, you know, what part of either the United States or if you're outside of the United States, where are you watching from? And when we look at our analytics for the YouTube videos, it's pretty wild to see kind of a, how wide ranging our viewership is. It, and it kind of blew my mind in the beginning to see, you know, obviously we're, I'm located in the Midwest, uh, United States, kind of right here in the Southwest Missouri. Uh, but we've got viewership of course, across the United States, but also into Canada, uh, a few different countries in Europe of all places, then, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand also popped up there. Uh, those are kind of the, the top five places for us. So why don't you guys let us know where you're from so we can say hi and, uh, yeah, we'll get this show rolling. All right. Brian starts off with a question. What's your opinion on mini skid steers and the best one for use with an auger attachment? So we use, we, right now we use ding, we use the, uh, dingo mini skids. That being said, when they're ready to be upgraded, we're going to switch to a Bobcat. Uh, I've used the MT 85 and really like it. They're upgrading the MT 85 to an MT, I believe it's MT 100. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong down in the comments, I'd like to know, but the MT 100, it's basically, uh, from what I've heard, I haven't, I haven't tested one, haven't demoed one yet. Cause we're not ready to upgrade. I don't want to put the cart before the horse there, but, uh, the, the, it's basically an MT 85 with a weight pack up front to give it a little bit more down, uh, down pressure, a little bit more weight on the front, uh, to help get that auger down. Um, so MT hundred is probably what we'll upgrade to after the dingo, uh, just gives us all it's got. Uh, it's still, I think it still has a little bit of time left in, in it. So, uh, but yeah, the Bobcats are good machines. I've heard guys have good experience with the Vermeer units. Uh, actually some of our competitors here locally use Vermeer and it sounds like they really like them. Um, I, I demoed one and I wasn't, it has plenty of power. Don't get me wrong. It actually probably has is probably a little overpowered It's a little twitchy on the controls. My main concern is, uh, if you're loading one of those things up or unloading it, you know, I know how I would drive it, but you know how folks can get. And if, if I had a, you know, early morning and I'm still a little groggy, uh, the controls are a little twitchy for me. And if I'm loaded up on a flatbed trailer, I'd really worry about rolling that thing off a trailer. It, um, like I said, controls are really twitchy. Uh, but you hear this, you hear the opposite feedback on some other machineries that the, that the controls are really laggy, that they're a little soft, that they're not as responsive. So, uh, I, like I said, I've had personal experience. We use Dingo now, but when we're ready to upgrade, we're going to upgrade to that, uh, Bobcat MT 100, uh, whatever. Well, MT, I go back and forth. I'm questioning myself on whether it's the MT 100 or 110. Uh, it's one of the two of those. It's the upgrade from the MT 85. We've used that and really liked it in the past. Um, yeah, so that'd be, that'd be what I use now. Obviously we use it mainly with the auger attachment. But usually when we when we pick one up, we'll pick it up with uh, forks and also a bucket, uh, and we'll take and those three attachments go to every job: the auger attachment, the bucket, and the forks. Because it's surprising how much you use those, you know. So we'll use it obviously with the auger to dig the holes, uh, but then we'll come around also with the bucket to pick up any sort of uh, excess dirt or rocks if we're hauling dirt off the site. Uh, the forks come in handy. To put a pallet on that, and then uh, helps you distribute uh, concrete around the job or move any uh, any larger rocks. Helps bring them out. Also the forks help when you're uh, doing removal to bring off the site, the excess material, the, the old existing materials. So, uh, I was, I was kind of surprised at how much we use the other attachments too. So 
Brian, great question. Brian's letting us know from Toronto, Canada. Welcome to our Fence Fam to the North. I appreciate you guys, Brian. Uh, I would assume you guys are getting into a uh, into the winter season now. Uh, here in the Southwest Missouri, it's already started getting cold. I think today, actually this morning, it was supposed to um, it was supposed to snow. We had a chance for some snow showers. Didn't happen. And if even if it had happened, it's been probably uh, upper 40s, lower 50s throughout the week. It wouldn't have stuck anyway, but probably would have looked pretty. Uh, would have really uh, really freaked people out. It seems like the first snow of the year always always freaks people out in terms of their driving around town. So uh, that's bound to happen eventually. So Brian, thanks for your question. Appreciate you joining us. Let's start off with a couple of questions from the, uh, from our community tabs. I've actually got those saved here. So ZL Spile 5 says, Hey Joe, what is your method for setting a steel post in concrete? Do you pour the dry mix and then add water or mix the concrete above ground and then pour in the hole or some other method? Thanks. So this is, um, this is one of those topics where if you ask 10 fence guys, you'd likely get five or six different answers and each answer, each guy thinks or gal thinks their answer is the correct answer. And it's probably the only right answer out there. The way we do it is we'll dry set a form of dry set. I suppose is water goes in the hole. Concrete, dry mix concrete goes in the hole, gets tamped down, made really secure, and then water will go back on top. And then typically what we'll do is we'll take, uh, we use grounding rods we have, or I've seen guys use tension bars, and and drive those down in the concrete to try to mix that water in with the concrete. And then the remainder of the concrete will suck up all the moisture out of the ground. So in the in south, southwest Missouri, our ground is really wet. I mean, we, when you go down six, eight inches, you start getting really moist soil. Now, I mean, that, of course, that probably, with the exception of drought-type conditions or that, that sort of thing, but typically, most year-round, uh, the soil, the water table is fairly high. The soil stays pretty wet. Uh, so we don't have problems with that. Now, I've said that before, and the feedback is, well, you have to dry or you have to wet mix it and then pour it in the hole because if not, it'll be crumbly, and, and that's the only way to do it. And that's fine. We've done that in the past. So... Uh, when I was working my way through high school, when my dad owned the business, all we did, well, and actually when my granddad had the business as well, uh, we wet mix. So it was mixed in a, most of the trucks, we had dedicated set trucks. And so they had mixers, concrete mixers on them. Um, so when my granddad had the, had the business, granddad had the business rather, uh, we actually mixed the components individually. So you'd have your ratios of aggregate to Portland to, you know, whatever it is you're mixing in there. And, and, you know, of course, some water, mix it up, make sure it's ready. And then you dump it into your wheelbarrow and wheelbarrow it through. Uh, then we progress to ready mix or not ready mix, but the pre-mixed sacked concrete. Uh, Quickcrete is one of the brands. It's a brand we use. Of course, there's sackcrete and there's others out there. Um, and we'd pre-mix that in the wheelbarrow and then dump it in. Uh, eventually, we, eventually, we started dry setting it. And kind of experimented at my family's place just to get a feel for it. And honestly, guys, we haven't had any problems. We've been doing we've been doing it this way since, you know, probably early nineties. It was way before I had started with my dad, but uh, you know, my granddad was doing the premix too earlier than that. So it, there's more than one way to perform every task, right? So this is the way that works for us. I absolutely understand if there's guys and gals out there that only wet set and that's completely fine. You know, so also he had asked DL Spile, I believe is how you'd say that, uh, had asked about other methods. So one method that we're going to be you know, experimenting with, trialing this winter is direct drive. So driving the post directly into the ground. Now it does require a longer post, but the data I've seen shows that a driven post is just as strong, if not stronger than a, a post set in concrete. And the reason being... So the, the study goes into detail in, you know, when you're digging this hole, you're disturbing the soil around the hole. So you're actually loosening all the soil around the hole as, as the auger is tilling down into the earth and bringing all the rocks and everything up, it's rocking and it's moving all that soil. It's, it's, uh, loosening the soil all around the hole to the entire depth of the hole. So when you pour concrete in that hole and you use concrete the post in, it leaves a chance for those posts to be less secure in the ground until the ground is recompacted, which could take a while. 
with driving a post, you're not actually disturbing the soil around the post. So it could lead to a stronger post. Um, and also you have other benefits as to you're not concerned with is every batch of concrete, the same PSI as the rest of them. Did you get, you know, a weak mix or a strong mix? Uh, is every, is every whole proportion correctly? You get away from that too. And the larger guys that I've talked to that do this have multiple crews on one job. So they would have one crew that starts a job and works its way around driving the post. And the second crew starts right in behind them, starts finishing the fence, whether it's wood framing and nailing or chain link, starting to run rail in the, in the chain itself, uh, right behind the, I guess they wouldn't be a set crew anymore. Would they, they would be a drive crew or something like that. Uh, and where you could get a product, your project done in a day rather than set the post, wait, you know, depending on the weather, two to three days, you can use quick set. I get it. And you wait, I think it's two to three hours to, for cure time on that. Um, you could, you could start working right behind each other. So I'm pretty interested to try that this winter. So we're going to try the other method and just see how it goes. I'd like to hear your guys' experience. If you have experience wet setting or dry setting, or if you have experience driving it, I'd really be interested to hear uh, your guys' experience and, and how it's worked for you guys. We've got a couple more folks in here. Jeff says, hi, great show. I'm in London. That's incredible. Welcome, Jeff. Appreciate you having, or appreciate you having, appreciate you joining us. We appreciate having you. That's where my mind was going. I'm just wondering why we can't buy many of the tools and accessories in England. Cheers. You know, Jeff, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of the tools we buy are probably manufactured uh, domestically in the United States. So it might be import export would, would kind of be where my mind goes first. Uh, that being said, so we were just talking about driving posts. I follow a couple other YouTube channels, uh, where guys are using fairly substantially large driving machines. And, uh, those actually come from your neck of the woods from over abroad. So sometimes, sometimes it goes the other way. Sometimes we see guys, uh, importing equipment from your side of the pond, uh, over our way, but yeah, I don't know. I would, I would almost bet Jeff, it's probably import export issues. Um, yeah, cause a lot of the tools and honestly, a lot of the tools we make ourselves, uh, there's a lot of great companies that make tools. Uh, Mr. Fence tools is one of them. Uh, he, we've bought some of his tools to demo and I really like them. We're probably going to shoot a video on those tools. I would say probably this winter when we get some downtime, but, uh, but yeah, so they're made domestically. So I, I would guess that would probably be the issue, uh, but I'm not hundred percent sure one way or the other, Jeff, we really appreciate you joining us from across the pond in London. That's incredible. So I think right now, Jeff holds the title of our furthest uh, viewer or furthest away viewer in London. If you are further away from the United States in London, drop in the chat. If not, Jeff holds the record. Congratulations, Jeff. Jeff, I almost called you Jack. That's not right. Star Jazz Bell, is bamboo a reasonable material for a do-it-yourself for I live in Cleveland, Ohio with cold winters? Yeah, so um, bamboo, I've seen, so I've seen guys use bamboo in like a fence track style fence, uh, meaning that it has the complete frame around it and you're using bamboo for a filler. Um, I've seen that work fairly well. I haven't seen fence itself made from bamboo. Um, well, I say that, I guess I've seen the live bamboo. So folks that try to use live bamboo as a, as a fence or a green wall, uh, thing about live bamboo is it takes over everything and it does it quickly. So I, uh, I wouldn't recommend that, but I don't know. I don't know it. I'd be interested to hear if you guys have experience using bamboo. Um, but yeah, so if you're using a fence track style fence where you're simply using the bamboo to, um, fill a, the fill a picture frame, I guess you'd call it then. Yeah, I that, think it would work really well. And bamboo grows very quickly. So that's one of the reasons it's not great for a live fence is it grows very quickly and it takes over, but that's one of the great ways, one of the great things about it, uh, for using it in the fence track is it's a renewable resource. I mean, I, I guess technically you could say cedar and treated pine are a renewable resource as well, but not nearly at, as the rate of bamboo. So I can see that I, I don't have personal experience in it though. So I don't want to speak to it from a personal experience standpoint, but I've seen it done. And honestly, it looks really nice. I saw it. So. I don't know if it was on Fence Tracks Facebook page or maybe in one of the fence groups. It's probably been, I don't know, six or eight months ago. A guy had shown off a fence that they built uh, using the fence track, specifically using fence track, 
uh, with the bamboo fill, and I thought it looked really nice. It was unique. It gave it a lot of texture. It wasn't, you know, you don't see it every day. So it catches your eye as, as you're uh, scrolling through your Facebook feed. But, yeah, I can see it working out well. All right, Fence King is with us. Welcome, Fence King. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Fence King's with us just, just about every single video. I appreciate you. Uh, he's from the southern United States. So, uh, so far, we've got everywhere from southern United States to uh, Canada to London to Cleveland, Ohio. So, guys, I appreciate you joining us. If you've got more fence questions, drop them in the comments below, or we'll just start going through the questions that you guys have submitted. And we'll start off with, an, or we'll keep, go, keep it going with another one. Zachary Spile, S-P-I-L-L-E, Spile, Spiel. Uh, another question, I have a 30-degree frame, framer, so frame gun, and you and use two-inch ring shank for pickets and a three-and-a-quarter-inch ring shank for supports. I also differentiate between galvanized or stainless, depending on the material. The question is, where do you guys get your nails? Um, yeah, so we get our nails just from a, a national wholesaler. I, I want to say it's, it's uh, Nail Gun Direct, I believe. Um, you can also get them from, in the past, we've gotten them from Fastenal. We have a Fastenal location here. Uh, before Fastenal, we uh, before Fastenal, we got them from Duo Fast. So we ran Duo Fast Guns. Uh, do a fast, we had to do a fast uh, office here to where they service the guns. We also got our nails through them. It was very convenient. Uh, then the gentleman running the do a fast office uh, came into some health complications. It was just him there. And so they shut that down. And I don't know. I had to look around. I don't, I haven't seen one uh, do a fast office come back since he left, uh, which then made using do fast, not pointless, but a little bit harder to deal with because we didn't have a location to pick up nails and uh, location to service the guns. So, uh, yeah, we use a, we use a, a national wholesaler of nails. So, uh, they, they show up every week and they deliver our, whatever nails we need. They also pick up whatever guns we need and service those, you know, I would start there. Honestly, guys, if we're talking about where to buy nails and fasteners, I see that a lot. That was the only, the only, I don't know. It wouldn't really even be a complaint about, fa about fastenal is, you know, they don't service equipment. At least ours here doesn't, doesn't. Um, they've got plenty of locations, but, and if you're willing to order the exact item they have, then it's great. But what we got into is then we would have to go take our nail guns to someone else to service them. Uh, and then invariably, if you have, if you're buying nails from someone that doesn't service it, those two guys start pointing fingers at each other. If there's a service issue, cause you know, the service guy says, well, it's obviously the nails you're using, you know, they're causing whatever malfunction or failure. Uh, then you go to the nail guy and he says, oh, it couldn't possibly be us. It's got to be your equipment. And it's kind of a round, round, round robin uh, ordeal. The company we use, like I said, they they supply the nails, but they also service the nail guns. So it's a one-stop shop. They know exactly the nails we're shooting. They know how many of them we're shooting through the guns on average. And uh, and they service them really well. And typically, typically they service them for free as long as it's not major. You know, if it's... Uh, I don't know, it's usually rings that go bad in ours. So even though you oil them, you, those are still kind of the point of failure, the part of failure, because they're easy to replace. Uh, they'll usually take them. They, typically, he carries the tools there in his van, and uh, he'll service them right there in the van while, while he's on site. If not, he'll take it back with him and bring it back usually the next week. So uh, when you're choosing a provider of nails, it's important to ask them, you know, do you service this particular brand of gun? Um, yeah. Important things to know. So, uh, nail gun directed, I believe is where we buy it from, you know, I'll do this. So I'll go back to the office. I'll verify that. And I'll leave that in the comments below. So this live broadcast is actually going to live on our YouTube channel, just like all the rest. And so I'll go back in there after we're done recording and leave a comment in the comments below. i let you guys know where we're getting nails from. Fence King, best fence guy above high 12. Well, well, thank you. I certainly appreciate that. You know, honestly, guys, uh, Fence King's kind of in the same boat as I am. You know, we're all trying to we're trying to help the industry, right? We're trying to help propel the industry forward and try to make it better. So I certainly appreciate you. Oh, there you go. Uh, so I appreciate you. I got excited. So I'm watching the chat too as we go. So Zach's here. Uh, thanks for asking my. Uh, this is Zach. Thanks for asking my, answering my question about setting steel posts and nails. My last name is pronounced Speedy. Okay. Zach, I apologize. <laughs> Zach Speely. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you guys tuning in. You know, that's what, ultimately, that's what this channel is, 
is trying to be, you know, trying to be of service to a other fence, other fence fam out there. Uh, trying to give you guys, you know, a leg up because here's the thing is, you know, when I was coming up through the fence business and you still see this, this, I guess, to, to some extent, it was everyone for their own, right? So it's each dog on their own. Uh, no one, no one helped each other. No one really cooperated with each other. I mean, there are exceptions, don't get me wrong. Uh, but for the largest part, you know, no one gave away their secrets as if they were the only ones that knew them. Right. And what we're, what we found is in reality, we all have roughly the same answers, right? Because we all, we all see typically the same problems. That's what really gets me is, you know, you see sometimes in the comments, some of the videos, you hear guys say, well, you know what, my area, you know, that might work for you and your area, but in my area, it, you know, fill in the blank, whether it's rock or terrain or anything under the moon, uh, my area is so much different. And the funny thing is, it's really not. We all face similar problems. Now, you know, guys in, you know, Nebraska, maybe Kansas don't have as much you know, terrain to deal with. Maybe it's a little bit flatter. Um, guys, you know, near the, near the Rocky Mountains or the Appalachian Mountains probably deal with quite a bit more terrain. But overall, we all we all deal with roughly the same problems. And the joke I always say is, you know, everyone always acts acts like they have it the worst. And if you ever wanted to test this theory, you know, next time you're at a fencing convention, you know, fence tech's coming up in February, all you need to do is stand in the middle of an aisle. Don't, don't even talk to anybody. And say, you know what? You guys have it good because where I am, we've got rocks. And just wait because the room will stop and then everyone will tell you you're wrong and they have it so much worse because not only do they have rocks, but they are boulders and they are so hard to get out. Or this other guy will say or gal will say, well, oh, yeah, well, at least you can get yours out. Ours is a solid rock. We have to drill straight into it. Everyone always thinks they have it the hardest. But to bring, I guess, this little this feel back around is the reason I started the channel is to try to bring education to, you know, or try to share education uh, with those of you in the fence industry that are like me and wanting to learn. You know, I'm constantly, I constantly watch YouTube, these uh, uh, others, YouTube channels, uh, trying to learn about what it is I don't know, because there's quite a lot out there that I don't know. Uh, in our business, you know, while I've built fence for years and years and years, my role in our business now is more of the business management side, because, you know, honestly, that's where I see a lot of companies run into problems is these guys and gals are great craftsmen. You know, they build really great fence, but they don't give enough attention to the business side, to, to the back end and the part of the business that nobody sees, but the part of the business that is arguably some of the most important, you know, if we're talking about billing, you are you billing out your customers on a reasonable and within a reasonable time frame? Are you getting paid? Are you following up with the customers that haven't paid? Are you paying your bills on a, in a reasonable time? Are you following up with vendors on materials? That sort of thing. The back end of the business probably doesn't get enough attention. And when I see businesses fail, you know, cause they say the average lifespan of a fence company of a new start fence company is three to five years. And that's pretty consistent across the board with new businesses in general. I really think that one of the issues with, businesses that fail, new fence companies that fail in the first three or five years, is it craftsmanship? You know, these are guys that have typically, and gals that have typically, you know, worked for a fence company for a number of years and have honed their craft and are really, really good at it, but they decide they're gonna go out on their own because they see all the money that the business is bringing in and they don't, they don't see their, you know, in their eyes, their fair share of that money. And what they do is they go out in the market and they say, well, you know what, this company was charging X dollars per foot. And I think that's outrageous. I'm going to charge Y dollars a foot, sometimes half as much as, you know, the company they were working for. And what they realize is they're, they're doing themselves a disservice because they'll do this for a few years and they'll eat through the savings they have and they'll work themselves, you know, to where they're not healthy anymore. And then in three to five years, they're grumpy, they're tired, their body's hurt or broken and they're out of money and they fold up shop. And they, at that point, they're so disenfranchised that they leave the industry. They go somewhere else, you know, they, they pick a different trade or they retire altogether. And ultimately, so in that three to five years, they've, they've brought their local industry down because they now all of a sudden they're telling the marketplace that no, 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 that first price, the price X is way too much for what this is. You should be paying Y and it brings the marketplace down 
in price, but then also when they leave, they do the industry a disservice because they were actually a really good, really good craftsman. They just weren't a good business person. They focused more on the fence than they did on the business, which both parts are important. If, if you run a good business, but you don't build good fence, you're also doing the service too. So anyway, where I was going with that is my role lately has been more on the back end, kind of the, the behind the scenes business operations, the accounts payable and receivable, the marketing, just the day-to-day -day business operations as a whole. And that's kind of my role. And so what I'm doing is, is especially in terms of marketing and like with this channel and YouTube is I'm watching guys like Nick Nimmin. You know, if you guys are, if you guys are getting into YouTube and want to start your own channel, Nick Nimmin is an incredible place to start. I mean, this guy is giving you the keys to the castle on YouTube channels on how to create engaging content that you guys would like to watch. You know, whether it's thumbnails or descriptions or how to organize your channel, types of content to create, that sort of thing. I'm constantly watching those, the, uh, constantly watching Nick. Uh, but I'll tell you another person that actually the guy that got me into this is Roger Wakefield. You know, he's a plumber in Texas. And this guy's YouTube channel is incredible. If you guys get the chance, you should absolutely watch Roger's channel. You know, he's doing what I'm basically trying to do is I'm trying to emulate his channel in that he's there for the homeowner. Uh, that's trying to gain knowledge about fencing and uh, or about plumbing in his channel rather uh and you know what pitfalls are there out there what should they watch out for in terms of you know vetting plumbers and that sort of thing but also he's helping the other side too he's helping the plumbers that are just starting out that are coming through trade school that sort of thing you know starting their own plumbing business so that's really what i'm trying to emulate more than anything is because i've seen the impact that roger has had on the plumbing industry and i said you know we need that in the fencing industry we really do and there's, there's other guys out there. I absolutely understand they're doing it for the fence industry as well. And I love it. You know, the more of us that can get passionate about helping the fence industry as a whole, the better the industry it will be. You know, I don't, there's no such thing as competition when it comes to YouTube. YouTube is such a huge resource that, you know, it, it really, it, you can't have it all. So if you guys are watching this and you're a fence contractor, I mean, I've told fence King this, he should absolutely start a YouTube channel. You know, I, I welcome that. I would absolutely help with that. You know, we need more folks that in our industry that are willing to help. And that's, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but there we are. So Zach follows it up. Um, so, okay. So Zach, so I had to apologize for mis mispronouncing Zach's last name, but apparently I'm not the first. So that's always good to hear. Following up, Jimbo says, we have it easy in the desert. Yeah, but Jimbo, it gets hot. Like, that's the thing is like, everyone has a limiting factor, right? So whether in the desert, you guys don't have many rocks, but it certainly does get hot, you know, in the summertime in the peak season, you guys, you guys have hours of the day that you just don't work. Or at least I visited with, when we were in Phoenix for fence tech, I visited with some fence uh, contractors out there and, uh, and kind of, it was over the winter time, but we were chatting about the summertime and we were kind of having a similar conversation, right? About the the hurdles that every fence company has while they are different, they're usually similar. And their hurdle was weather is in the summertime, they get started very early, but then they typically have to break midday because it has gotten so hot. And then they try to get back to it in the evening. So, well, Jimbo, while you don't have rocks, you certainly have other, uh, other factors such as heat. All right. Jamie has a great question. Jamie Hara. Hey, or hi at Joe Everest. When you, when do you project the price of lumber returning to normal? Greetings and thanks from San Jose, California. Welcome, Jamie, from California, our first Californian of this broadcast. Uh, that's a great question. And it's a question. So uh, I interviewed uh, uh, Tony Thornton, the executive director of the American Fence Association, and I'd asked him that. Uh, I believe it was on camera and we were kind of having our discussion. And, you know, so because I, I talked to our suppliers of wood, but I understand, but Tony talks to all the suppliers, you know, as being as the executive director of a national organization. So I wanted to get his opinion on where he sees the lumber industry. And what he had to say was he really thinks it's probably second quarter of next year before things really start to normalize. Now, what we've seen locally is supply is coming back. When we're talking about treated pine, supply is coming back. So prices are easing a little bit, but the problem is it's still number two. So number two grade lumber that is still priced for, in my opinion, significantly higher than it should be higher than what we were paying for number one. And I locally, I still haven't found number one treated lumber at any price. 
I believe it's to, it's probably still being used for higher margin items, you know, home building supplies uh, or dimension home building dimensional lumber uh, rather than in fencing and decking materials. But uh, I probably agree with Tony when I say probably second quarter of next year, which is, you know, April, May, June of next year. So what we're doing is, is kind of what we've been doing is what our plan is, is we offer cedar materials. So cedar is a little bit harder to find, but not to nearly to the extent of treated pine, at least for us, uh, we buy through uh, master Halco. We buy their Alta product. Uh, Alta makes a really good board. It's more expensive than what we had paid in the past for uh, different brands of boards, but it's a quality board. And, and ultimately, you know, if we're talking about two boards that are the same quality, then we can talk about price, but. Alta for me, for my money, is is probably the best quality board for the dollar. Uh, so we offer steel or cedar materials, the Alta lumber on steel posts. Now we use Postmaster Post through also through Master Halco. Uh, there's other brands. There's uh, the Lifetime Post is one of the Postmaster style uh, post. Uh, that's our offering is cedar on steel post because we can get both relatively easily. You know, uh, we might wait a week or two, but we're certainly not waiting six to eight weeks to get materials. Uh, yeah. So we're offering a material that we can get in and that is a quality that we're still proud to put our name on. Um, yeah. So let me know if you guys are seeing anything different. I'm always trying to get the pulse on, you know, what the market's like everywhere else. Uh, you know, certainly here in the United States, but also abroad, um, you know, we've got a viewer from London currently. So I'd be interested to hear if, uh, you know, the lumber shortage that we're seeing here in the United States, if we're still, if they're seeing it across, across the pond, as they say, in Europe. Uh, also in the Canadian market, it'd be interesting to hear uh, if you guys are hearing or having the same difficulties getting lumber, uh, seeing as how a lot of the Western Red Cedar actually gets uh, imported down from Canada. I'd be interested to hear all that. Your guys' experience on that. All right. Now this is a name. Boo Boo Bang Bang. And I'm not even going to ask about it. Where can I find the stealthy style steel post to build my eight foot fence? So I'd have to think you're talking about uh, the post you can hide. So that's how, that's what stealthy style sounds like. And I just talked about, so the postmaster steel posts are the ones we use. Uh, you can buy those through master Halco. Uh, also locally, our Lowe's carries them. Um, and I haven't found them in our, in our, uh, home depots, but in the video I did on the postmaster steel post, uh, several of the comments, uh, stated that they had picked him up in Home Depot. Uh, after I saw the comments, I went online to our local Home Depots and searched their inventory, and they didn't have them. Uh, but it sounded, I believe the comments had come in uh, from the southeast, from down in uh, Florida. So uh, it might be a regional thing. It might depend on where you are. But uh, we buy ours directly from Master Halco, uh, but you can certainly find them uh, in home stores, it seems like. I know we can find them locally in, in uh, Lowe's. Uh, there's also other brands of posts. Lifetime is the other one. I simply don't have experience with the other posts because we've had good experience with uh, postmaster posts and you know, a lot of things are, you know, the way of, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. So it's a good product with a good warranty at a good price point for the quality of uh, material we're getting. Uh, so we just stick with that. So if you're a fencing, if you're a fencing contractor, uh, master Halco would be the spot for you. If you're a DIY, um, home installer or, or installing your own fence, uh, try your Lowe's home Depot, I haven't seen any of them in Menards, but uh, it's always worth a shot. Oops. All right, Joe, the word I'm getting from my from my mills in South Alabama and Tampa, the prices are about to go back up and what is going to go back scarce. I'm stocking up now just in case. So that's interesting to hear. Um, so we're going into winter. Um, of course, our winter is different than the Canadian winter is different from the Florida winter, right? But we're going into winter and typically we start slowing down. We're seeing that in our, in our workflow. You know, we went from six, eight, 10 weeks out to now we're probably in that four to six, uh, ballpark for a wood, in, a wood product installed. Um, but typically, so typically the supply goes down in the winter time uh, or the supply goes up in the winter time because the demand comes down. Uh, there's less fence being built in the winter time. Now, you know, I see guys in the fence groups that are, that are saying that they're still booked for months out. And so that might be the case in other regions where they're just still so booked out that the demand is still really high, that it'll keep the supply low. So definitely interesting that in the South, the Southeast, it sounds like, um, sounds like the supply is still really low. So keeping demand high. All 
So, uh, Dylan asked, Joe, did you just say Alta is owned by Master Halco? So, we buy Alta lumber through Master Halco. My understanding is that the holding company uh, that owns Master Halco, that now also owns Jameson Fence Supply, that merged those two, uh, also owns Alta lumber. Um, that's certainly been my understanding. Uh, actually, I've heard that from Master Halco reps, is that uh, Master Halco is owned by the same holding company that owns Alta lumber. And because I, I was kind of giving him a hard time, I'd heard that. And he was, he was telling me how, you know, the prices were going up in Cedar anyway. And I said, man, you guys own this lumber company, right? Why, why, are, why are you getting price increases when you own the place? And his point was, listen, we don't own them. The people that own us own them. And so while we do probably get preferential pricing, we still don't have control over it. They're a completely different company, just kind of under the same, same umbrella. But that's my understanding. If you have a different understanding, drop it in the comments below. Let's try to get caught up here in the comments. Let's see. I'll try to scroll up. I think I think we missed some. So David, uh, I think I answered this question. How do I find a dealer for metal fence post? When I try to find the ones you recommend in my area, Southern Illinois, I get forwarded to a fence install company. I want to do the job myself. Yeah, so uh, probably, yeah. So you would probably reach out to Master Halco, which is who owns the patent for the postmaster steel post they'd refer you to a fence company now a lot of fence companies though will sell the posts retail so we primarily install fence we're a fence installation contractor but we also have a retail division that sells you know these posts in you know retail uh we don't ship them we don't we, we don't send them anywhere but if folks show up we'll certainly sell them a lot of fence companies i think are, are set up this way it makes sense for them to be set up this way anyway uh, so when they're referring you to the fencing contractors, it might be that that contractor is someone they know that they sell to that also sells to the public. Um, Master Halco doesn't typically doesn't sell to the public, and typically they have some criteria uh, for fencing contractors to to meet when they in order for them to start an account with Master Halco. So um, yeah, so reach out to a few of those fence companies that they recommend though, and just see if they sell retail. And if not, ask them who does. I mean, the guys that don't, I mean, they'll tell you who sells retail to the public. I would, uh, I would certainly start there. Boo Boo says, love your content. Also great brand. Thank you. You know, the, the orange branding is we've talked about it before. Uh, why actually I did a whole video on just why I wear orange because that's, you know, the number one comment and, and we'll call it uh, constructive criticism. Uh, I get is about the color orange and a lot of it. Actually, there was one in one of the videos today that popped up on my comment feed that says something like, uh, what's going to happen when the sheriff and his chain gang come through town and you get scooped up in the process. My thought is like, listen, if jails are handing out, you know, button up collared long sleeve jumpsuits with their name on them. I don't know. I'll probably have to explain to them that this is my brand, but I'll also be driving a big orange truck that has my branding all over it. So, uh, it'll probably be pretty easy to explain to them. And of course it's said in jest, right? Uh, because that's the image that, that it evokes right off the bat. But the fun thing is it grabbed their attention, right? So they saw it either when they're scrolling through their feed, they saw a thumbnail and they decided to click on it and comment or, or whatever the situation was. The, the thing is it got their attention and that's ultimately as a marketer, that is any marketer's goal is to grab attention to find the eyeballs wherever they are and bring the eyeballs on them or their brand or their company. And that's what we try to do. So my fencing, my fencing company is branded all orange. So whether it's our trucks, whether it's our shirts, hats, like literally everything we do is orange and it has such an, such a huge impact. You know, so I went out, uh, so we've got we've got a little one coming, uh, either late this month or first part of next month. And so we had a diaper party, right? Where me and some guys went to a driving range and hit golf balls for a while. And uh, we had just done family pictures. And if you guys watch any of my content, you know, my wife does not like the color orange, probably just because I'm all about it all the time. And it's a little much, I understand it, but it is what it is. So we just done family pictures though. And in family pictures, we're not allowed to wear orange. It's a rule imposed by the queen of the castle. And we, you know, certainly everyone abides by it. So. But when we went out to hit range balls, I was wearing this shirt that wasn't orange. And immediately, of course, everyone in my group was, what, are you feeling okay? Or is there something we should be concerned about? Why are you not wearing orange? What's happened? Uh, and of course I told him, you know, I had family pictures and everyone kind of got it. 
Uh, but what's funny is I ran into a few people that I knew, but not not buddies per se, right? So I knew them from the community, just in, either in business dealings or friends of friends. And have both of them, the, both of them had the same thing to say. They're like, uh, why aren't you in orange? That you look weird. I didn't recognize you at first. Now, of course, I was wearing an orange cap. So if that if I'm gonna rebel, at least I can rebel a little bit. I can throw on a baseball cap because we're not taking pictures anymore. Um, so I, said, I wouldn't have recognized you in, <laughs> except for that orange hat. So yeah, I know. Anyway, the point being is for as many as many comments as I get about being an inmate and an escaped convict and whatever else the comments have to say, it gets attention. And biggest marketing tip I can give is, you know, if you're a fence contractor, do something that gets attention and keeps it, that makes you memorable, right? So an example I'll use is here locally, we have a company that they clean air ducts, you know, the HVAC ducts throughout your house, they clean them. Well, the lady who is their uh, spokesperson, she's their marketing lady, uh, she wears a chimney sweep, sweep outfit complete with like a chimney sweep. And she just walks around the aisles with this thing and just getting everyone's attention. Now, do they use chimney sweeps? No, they probably actually don't do, as far as I know, they just do HVAC duct cleaning, but she gets people's attention because she's wearing a chimney sweep outfit and she's carrying a real chimney sweep. And it makes people pause and think, what is she doing? And they ask her, what's the deal? And then she tells them what she does and she introduces them to her company and now she's memorable. So when someone comes about, you know, for whatever reason they need their ducks cleaned, they go, you know what? There's that lady and she wears a chimney sweep. Remember her and they'll go find her and they'll call her business probably first. And if not first, she'll be in the top three. She'll get a shot at the job no matter what, because she was memorable. And that's kind of where I come from. I want to be memorable. So in our home shows, when we go to do a home builders association home show, or we go to lawn and garden show, any of the shows, community, community, uh, chamber of commerce shows, whatever. I've got an orange blazer I wear with an orange top hat. Nothing to do with fence, right? The blazer, blazer and top hat are so out of character for a fence company, but it grabs attention. One that they're bright blaze orange. It's an orange top hat. I mean, so then people, then the comments are not convict they're dumb and dumber, right? Okay, that's fine. I'll take it because I'm going to be memorable. And when someone comes to think about needing a fence or someone comments on Facebook asking for recommendations about someone that builds a fence, hopefully I want to be in their brain as that guy. What is, who is that company? What is his name? You know, he wears the Jack and the top hat, that orange top hat. I mean, I go out a lot. I do the tip of the hat. I do the whole thing because I want to be memorable. Anyway, I don't know where we we're going with that one either, but my biggest, biggest piece of advice is do something in your business that makes you memorable, that stands out to where people, you all of a sudden live rent free in this person's brain, in the back of their mind to where when they need your service, they go, Oh, you remember this thing about this person? That's who I need to call, or that's who I need to recommend. You should look this person up because so I, I do that for the cost of a blazer and a top hat, right? And it's the same blazer I've had for like three years, same top hat I've had for three years. I've gotten my money out of them. I'm certain of it. So now it's free. I just do it. You know, all of our trucks are bright orange, certainly not free, but it is impactful. Biggest piece of advice I can give. All right. So Zach asked, repeat the name of the fencing convention in Convention. So the fencing convention itself is going to be in Nashville this year. Uh, so it's fence tech. It's uh, the American fencing association puts it on. It's in Nashville this year. So it's in February. Uh, so technically I guess next year, 2021. And after that, it's coming to new Orleans. It's going kind of down in the fence Kings territory down there. Uh, yeah. Fence tech. So fence, normal spelling tech, T E C H, uh, 2021. If you look it up, you'll certainly find it, or you can go on the American Fence Association's website. They have it there. Uh, you can get all registered to go to that. Uh, actually, Fence King and I were chatting on Facebook the other day. He's registered for it. He's got his hotel books and everything. And uh, so if nothing else, you will see the Fence King and I there. You know what we ought to do, guys? We ought to, for those of you that want to and that feel comfortable and that are going and all that, uh, we ought to have a meetup, right? Um, whether it's at a bar or a lobby or somewhere, we all ought to meet up and try to do this in person. I think that'd be, uh, I think that'd be pretty neat for me. That would be a little bit more fulfilling than this. Cause literally right now it's, uh, me, I'm, I'm by myself in a room and I'm talking to a camera, uh, talking to you guys out there. So if I could do this in person, it'd certainly feel a little less awkward. 
Uh, Jimbo's got a question. How long do you let projects lapse? I see fence companies that start too many jobs and can't finish the projects in a timely manner. Yeah, so this is huge, Jimbo. I, I see it also. And actually, so there's a fence company here locally that's in a bit of hot water for doing that. Um, took a took a lot of deposits because they were the low price leader on fencing uh, and then started them so that they could you know, justify taking the deposit and then just haven't finished them. And I'm talking about months ago started these things. Um, so our, our projects all happen in a week, weather depending, all happen in a week. So we start a project on either a Monday or Tuesday, finish it Thursday, Friday. So we start at Monday, finish Thursday, start Tuesday, finish Friday with Wednesday in the middle as a flex day. And the flex day is important, right? Because it accounts for weather. Today, it's been kind of a, a rainy, nasty mess. Now, were we out building fence? Yes. Were we at peak performance? No. But we knew this weather was coming. So yesterday, Wednesday, we usually use Wednesday. If, if the weather's perfectly fine, we use it just to deliver materials around town so that when we show up to finish the fence, everything's there. It's already out. It's ready to go. Uh, but what we did Thursday, what we did yesterday is we knew Thursday was going to be a little rainy. So we started working ahead of ourselves on Wednesday, knowing that when it's wet, we don't work at peak efficiency. So they're actually a little bit ahead of schedule when they started out their day today, which everyone likes to breathe a sigh of relief at the beginning of the day, knowing that they're not already behind the eight ball. Um, yeah. So Wednesdays are a flex day for us. Now in our setup too, it's important to note one crew starts and finishes a job. So we don't have set crews and finish crews. We have crews that are uh, split by what type of fence they install. So we've got one crew that does, you know, residential wood. We have one crew that does commercial chain link. And then we've got uh, other crews that kind of do a little bit of everything. Some guys do uh, chain link and ornamental iron. Uh, we, one crew that does really good at steel. And we also have some production guys in the shop, that sort of thing. But to answer your question, everything starts and finishes in the same week. Um, now, if it pours three days out of that week, the project might get pushed to the next week, but that's okay because we know we've got that flex day the following week and everything's going to be fine. Mondays and Tuesdays works get bumped to Tuesday, Wednesday, what should have been done Friday gets done Monday. Uh, so in extreme examples, your circumstances, sometimes the week is finished or the work is finished the next week. Um, but yeah, so we don't like to let, I typically don't like to let jobs hang over a weekend, uh, because as a homeowner, if that project's left over the weekend, you have all weekend to look at it and just kind of get upset about it, right? So you got this fence and it's not done. And you're going to sit there all day Saturday and all day Sunday, and you're going to look at this fence that isn't done. And that's not a positive experience. So by having a project wrapped up by the weekend, now all of a sudden that client is home and they're looking at their new fence around their yard and they're happy about it. And, and they have a chance to work, to open and close the gates to let us know if they've got any questions on operations or whatever it is. And it's a better experience if we finish it all in the same week. Great question. All right. So Jacob wants to know, talk about those hinges some more. I can't get over how awesome they are. I agree, Jacob. So it's a shark hardware. So shark, shark hinges, shark latches. It's a company named Forney Fence, F-O-R-N-E-Y. They're out of Texas. I don't have any, any affiliation with them. I buy them, but I certainly buy them at full price. Um, so Forney Fence, if you're listening out there, I mean, maybe we could work out a deal. Uh, but no, so Forney Fence out of Texas is where we import them from. Uh, the shark hinges and shark latches. I like them a lot. You know, we did a whole video, so I'm sure that's probably where Jacob saw us. We did a video all about the hardware and the gate frames that we use. Um, now, my understanding is that Forney Fence owns the patent on shark engines and shark latches. So lately we've been having a bit of a difficult time getting as many of them as we need. Uh, so typically we'd order 50 latches. So fit and our latches are separated by singles and double gates. So we'd order 50 single gates, 50 double gate latches and a hundred hinges. Cause you need, you need one is a hundred sets, a hundred boxes of hinges. Cause that's a hundred gates. So in now, we typically use more single gate latches than double gate latches. And so it kind of gets off, but typically we order 50, 50 and a hundred lately though, when we place our order, we typically get a call back, you know, within a few minutes saying, you know, I know you ordered 50, but could you take 30? We, we didn't get as many in, so they import them. They didn't get as many in and you know, it, it didn't becomes an issue. So, uh, but yeah, for any fence out of Texas is where we get them from. I'll say this. So I've referred them to several people. Uh, through email that email me asking for their contact information. I'm, I literally just Google Forney fence and give them 
that information I find. Um, but sometimes I get feedback back that, you know, well, the, you got to pay shipping, right? So what they do is they'll palletize this hardware and they'll send it via pallet. So it's sent via freight, which is not the least expensive way to ship things. Um, but when you're shipping pallets, you really don't have a choice. So shipping is a bit high uh, if you're buying hardware through them, but uh, we don't sell it. We don't sell it retail only because I don't have a great way to ship it either. And plus I pay the same price that everyone else does. So by the time, you know, on the re if we try to retail it, mark it up to try to account for storing it and shipping and all that, it probably wouldn't be competitively priced. So I say all that to say Forney Fence out of Texas, it's shark hinge and shark latches. Great question, Jacob. All right, let me scroll down, get caught up a little bit more. So, yeah, so Boo Boo says the orange in your brand is perfect. What do you call that orange? Well, so the, na the name of our company is Ozark Fence. So uh, we call it Ozark Fence Orange. It's typically, it's typically blaze orange. Um, now, we have a color code for the specific orange that we like. Uh, so if we're getting, you know, tablecloths printed or if we're getting, you know, a backdrop like this, but if we're getting printed like on brand with Ozark Fence, we'll give them our color code. And they'll try to get as closely, you know, as close to that code as possible. Um, yeah, but we call it Ozark Fence Orange, but it's typically called Blaze Orange. That's right. Can't miss an orange truck coming through town. So I actually, so I stole this idea, uh, the color branding idea from a friend of mine in town that they own a plumbing and HVAC business. And his dad, he's my age, his dad, uh, they started color branding yellow. And I don't know, I'll have to, I'll have to bring him on. We'll, we ought to talk about color branding for an episode. I need to ask him why yellow? Like, I don't, I'm not sure where yellow came from, but they are all in on the color yellow, all their trucks, all the, everything's yellow. And their jingle actually is the big yellow truck will let you know we're there. And it goes on with their jingle, but that's what they're known for is the big yellow trucks. And so I thought, how genius of an idea is that? Now, when I looked at our, you know, our trucks at the time, they're kind of all different colors. Now they had magnets on them and, or, you know, when we upgraded for magnets, we'd put little logos on the side of the door, uh, but they're all different colors, whites and reds and blacks and grays and whatever the colors were, I, that doesn't look consistent. So what we do now is we wrap it. We vinyl wrap our trucks. All of our trucks are orange. What that lets us do is that lets us buy whatever color truck is on the lot. And literally we'll just tell them, I want whatever the, you know, whatever the spec is we want on the truck you know, and usually trades. We like Ram products just for consistency, uh, whatever, you know, so Ram's base model is a tradesman. I need a tradesman quad cab half ton or three quarter. Well, whatever we need it, spec that whatever color you got. And so what that does is it lets us buy a little bit more reasonably because we can buy a color of truck that's been sitting there for a little while. Maybe, you know, hot red isn't the color right then. No one wants to buy this bright red truck. We'll buy it because we're going to wrap the thing anyway. It can be pink with purple polka dots. We're still going to wrap it orange and no one will tell the difference. So, yeah, and you can't miss it. Big orange trucks driving through town. Can't miss that at all. So... Yeah, so Utah Vols country, you can you can charge extra wearing the orange here. Let's not talk about the team though. I, I get it. So here's here's the funny thing is, you know, so back pre pandemic when folks could travel freely, uh, when I was going to conventions or trainings or whatnot, I could always tell like what part of the country someone was, was from when they'd come up and ask me if I was for like insert this team that wears orange, right? So here in Southwest Missouri, it's Oklahoma. You big Oklahoma fan? No. Big fan of Ozark Fence, though. Or they'll say, that's always a joke. Or they'll say, uh, you big Texas fan? Nope. Pretty big fan of Ozark Fence, though. And they always look at me like, they don't know Ozark Fence, right? Like, we're a family-owned fence company. It's about Southwest Missouri. They haven't heard of us. Um, but, yeah, so the Vols come up. Uh, gosh, who else? Uh, Syracuse wears orange. Uh, you always know where someone's from when they ask me about the team. But I'm not going to – we're not going to talk about the team per Boo Boo's request. I'm just going to keep calling you boo boo. I like that. Don't tell me your name. I just want to, I just want to call you that. All right. So Jimbo's back to the discussion on, uh, on taking deposits, uh, getting the deposits and the customers end up getting angry and frustrated now. So I'll say this. So the way we're set up is to get on our schedule, to get scheduled, to perform the work, you have to put a deposit down now in the summertime that could be four or six weeks. 
Yeah, well, actually, in the summertime, it could be six to eight, ten weeks, depending on which year we're talking about. You know, this year is always a bit different in the summertime. Um, I, th- I think at one point we were eight to ten weeks out. Uh, so you, you conceivably could give us a deposit, and then it could be eight weeks before we're there to build a fence. Um, but, but we're upfront about that. We're upfront with the customers. Like, that's how – that's how our process works is we need a deposit to get you on the schedule because especially the summer, think about this. So as crazy as prices we're getting, if we didn't have the material in stock, we were buying that material as soon as we got the deposit because prices were probably going to change the next day. So, you know, we couldn't schedule the work. We couldn't order the materials until the deposit came. So it could, you could get into a scenario where the deposit is eight weeks away from the installation date, but we were up front with that. And, if a customer wasn't comfortable with that, that's fine. There are other contractors in our market that have different policies on deposits and they might be a better fit for the project. If the customer wasn't comfortable with that, my thought on, on it is this is by the time we get to the discussion about deposits, if that customer doesn't know, like, and trust us enough to give us a deposit, we probably haven't done a good job anyway. At, at explaining who we are and our history here in the community. I mean, we've been at this 65 years. If they, you know, if eight weeks is concerning that, you know, between deposit and installation, we probably haven't done a good job explaining who we are, or maybe they're just not comfortable with that. And that's fine. That's completely okay. But that is our policy and it is our process. All right. So let's see here. Let's talk about Mark Knudsen's question. So actually let me, let me hydrate here for a second. It's not a product plug. This is just where I ate lunch. All right. So Mark Nutson's question. Um, so he owns a manufacturer, a domestic manufacturer. And he and I have talked about this before, um, about what he, what he's always, what he was talking about is product liability insurance. So, you know, product li- liability insurance can come into effect when, the when the manufacturer you know provides a part so in the example he told us about was a latch a gate latch and it was a, a double gate latch the gate was left open you know and so if anyone that's seen a double gate latch it's the striker bar obviously protrudes past the gate so this gate was left open and uh, the uh, girl was riding her horse through the gate wind blew the gate shut into the horse the horse spooked and actually spooked into the fence and it drove that stri- striker bar into the side of this horse. And of course the horse panicked and made the wound significantly worse, you know, threw the rider off, ran off. They, inv- they eventually caught the horse, but had to have a lot of surgery. And this of course was a prized show horse. Uh, so the people with the horse sued the fence company that installed the fence. Now the gate was installed correctly, but the part that they had installed had injured their horse. So, this grieving family is looking for anyone else to take responsibility for this. So they sue the fencing contractor. Uh, the fencing contractor in turn turns around and sues Mark's company. Mark produced this latch or so they thought. And so Mark has product liability insurance. And what this does is it protects Mark in this exact instance. Now, you know, this horse did not get hurt as any result of Mark's company. I mean, he just made the latch. He didn't install the latch. He didn't, you know, suggest how the latch was to be installed in such a way that it hurt this horse, but it was his latch. So he got involved in this anyway. Um, Fast forward a little bit through the story is that come to find out it wasn't Mark's latch. Mark usually did sell latches to this guy, but when they looked closer at some pictures of the latch, he knew right away that wasn't his. It was manufactured differently. He, you know, he used manufacturer's marks and that sort of thing. And this one didn't have that. So it wasn't Mark's latch anyway. So, you know, the insurance company who had hired these lawyers then went to went to the judge and kind of showed him these things and and it was done. But the scary thing is there is, is that, I mean, obviously Mark's company had product liability insurance, but what if he hadn't, right? So what if this is, and, and this example, you know, in this example, Mark's product didn't do anything wrong. He was just caught up in this, but what happened Yo, know, so let's let's say, I don't know, maybe we're talking about ornamental fencing. And it's ornamental fencing that is used, you know, in, as a railing on a porch. And the fitting that holds this railing to the columns fails. 
maybe it's a faulty, maybe it's a faulty, uh, faulty uh, piece of uh, hardware is the word I'm looking for. You know, this, this, you know, rail fails and God forbid somebody gets hurt. You know, hopefully you would hope it's a, it's a short fall, but maybe it's not. And it all happened because, you know, this fitting, this piece of hardware wasn't manufactured correctly. Or, you know, there was some defect in the way it was manufactured. And it led to this, you know, person getting hurt, getting harmed. So then that, you know, the grieving party, the affected party is then going to come back to the contractor that installed that railing. And they're going to say, hey, your railing hurt us or hurt our, our children or whatever the instance is. We're going to sue you. Well, then that contractor says, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, I didn't make this. I just used it. I just ordered it from a manufacturer. You need to talk to the manufacturer. So then the manufacturer gets involved in this. But so say in this example, the manufacturer is an overseas manufacturer. You know, we see this a lot, especially in the ornamental fencing. Uh, a lot of a lot of import material is out there. So in this scenario, you go try to bring the manufacturer into it because they're the one that made it. It's, it's their fault that this thing failed. And, but they don't have liability insurance, product liability insurance, and they're an overseas company. They're not even, they don't have a corporation registered here in the United States. Well, you're pretty much out of luck at that point. I mean, you could try to go find them wherever it is in the world that they manufacture these things, but your lawsuit's only good in the United States. You can't take a lawsuit to, for the most part, to an international business. So then you, the contractor, are stuck with that. And specifically your insurance is stuck with that because there's no one else on the hook for this thing failing. So Mark's Mark's question, and actually it was a question, it was phrased a little bit differently, but that was the gist of it is the importance of making sure as a contractor, the manufacturers you purchase from have product liability insurance. Now, most domestic manufacturers do, but I mean, it's important to ask, it's important to make sure that they do have the liability insurance, but especially if you're someone buying material from a company overseas, make sure they have product liability insurance in the United States. Make sure that God forbid something happens, you know, this fitting that you're buying from them or this piece of material you're buying from them, God forbid it fails, someone gets hurt or worse, that they have liability insurance. That way you're not the one on the hook for, you know, the damages that have occurred because of that faulty part. Anyway. That was, that was kind of a long, long roundabout way, but I think it's important. And I honestly think in my discussions with Mark, I think we're going to be talking about this more because as, as he and I got into this, honestly, before he and I talked about this, about product liability insurance, and we had talked about it a while ago before he and I talked about it. I hadn't even considered it. I had, you know, if you asked me about manufacturers, product liability insurance, I go, well, of course, I mean, surely everybody has that right. And come to find out. The answer is not really, you know, not if they're a, a international business that's selling here locally because the, you know, they aren't required to have it. Now they should, don't get me wrong, but it's not a requirement. Uh, so a lot of manufacturers don't, a lot of import manufacturers don't. And it's important to make sure if you're buying material, you're buying it from someone with product liability insurance. I'm going to turn off fan real quick. It is getting a little bit toasty. All right. Got these lights on, so we've got a couple LED lights, uh, roughly here. They're shining down. They get a little bit warm, even though they're LEDs. They're not supposed to be as warm, but they sure certainly are. All right, so let's do this. If you're new to the broadcast, if you're uh, new to watching this live broadcast, why don't you tell me who you are and where you're from? I'd sure, I'd sure, uh, sure love to hear from you. Let you let me know where you're from. So right now, the furthest away, the viewer that's the furthest away from, let's say me, from this studio is uh london we had let's scroll back up here and see who was it who was it who was it now we had brian brian was from toronto brian if you're still with us i appreciate it so he was the furthest until jeff popped up jeff's over there in london he's across the pond in london so currently jeff still holds the title as viewer who is furthest away from our studio here in southwest missouri and uh, we've also had let's go through here we've uh had some folks from Cleveland here. Of course, Fence King himself. He's below I-12. He's down there in the south. Uh, Chris says hello from Texas. Actually, I don't think we said hello to you yet, Chris. If we hadn't, hello. So we've got some folks from a little bit everywhere. Let's scroll down a little bit. 
So Jimbo's out in the desert. So Jimbo, if you're with us, why don't you tell us where in the desert you are? I mean, I, I'm guessing, uh, let's see, let's guess. So Arizona, I'm not, or I, desert. I, I'm going to guess Arizona. That's my guess. Uh, but why don't you let us know where you're from? Jamie is from San Jose, California. Welcome Jamie. Let's see. Let's keep scrolling. Boo Boo is in the middle of Tennessee. So actually, uh, Finsex coming near you, at least over in Nashville. Let's see who else is from where. Of course, if you guys have questions, drop them in the comments below. I uh, always willing to help out however I can. And also helps the time go by a little bit faster. Let's see. So, all right. So we're scrolling through. Jimbo says, sue the horse for being stupid. I don't know if he could, but uh, yeah, right. So that's, I mean, in this scenario, it's a no-win scenario. I mean, really, I mean, if you want to talk about it, I would, if if these were all the, or all the facts, and I have to assume they were, that the wind blew this gate shut and blew it into the horse, you'd, I would call that an act of God, right? I mean, it didn't happen because of faulty equipment. It didn't happen because the gate was installed incorrectly or it used bad hardware. The wind blew, or or maybe you sue the person that opened the gate and didn't didn't fasten it open. You know, I mean, there's so many ways you could go from that. It uh, anyway. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess Colonel. I'm gonna guess the name's Colonel. He's from North Florida. Actually, and then they, they followed up with Loman Fence. So welcome, Colonel, from Loman Fence. Let me know if that's not how you pronounce that name. I would certainly like to know. That's the first time I've seen the name. I like how it's original, and I'd sure hope that I am pronouncing it correctly. All right, guys, I was wrong. I guess Arizona. Jimbo is from the high desert in California. So we've got, let's see, we've got every, we've got, uh, so I'm in the Midwest. We have Canada to the north. We have uh, California to the West. We have Northern California now. So we have San Jose and Northern California. Uh, we've got fence King down in the South. We've got, uh, Colonel, if that's, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, in North Florida. Now, of course we have our friends across the pond in London, but I don't know that we have anyone from East coast of uh, the U S East coast, Northeast. So if you're from the Northeast or East, let me know. We'll have kind of the whole, uh, whole United States wrapped up here. Samarin, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly too. I would like to know your opinion on vinyl fence or wood. I'm in, okay, West Virginia. There is our East Coast viewer. Uh, I am I am a West Virginia resident. I'm building a new home. I want, I want the bright white look. It's a great look, nice clean look. I'm doing at least six foot privacy for the backyard. Absolutely, I think you're on the right track. So actually, so I had a comment uh, on one of the videos. I should have written it down actually on one of the videos asking about my opinions on vinyl. And here's my thoughts is it's a lot like any other material. So it's going to depend on, or, or any other type of fence It's going to depend on the quality of the material, right? So I've seen a lot of great vinyl fences installed. Uh, Mr. Fence, uh, up North, so he installs a lot of vinyl fence and the fences that he installs look really nice and they're qual high quality fences uh, because he uses high quality materials. Now you see other fences that last a season. And then they start, whether the inserts get blown out in a high wind or whether the posts bend in a high wind because they didn't have inserts uh, or the bottom rail uh, starts dipping because it doesn't have an insert. Uh, it's like anything. So it comes down to quality materials, right? Uh, but I've seen vinyl fences that look incredibly good for years and years. I mean, 10s, 20s, 30 years. I mean, there's some vinyl fences out there here in our, our market anyway, that have been installed for quite a long time that still look really nice. They still look nice and clean. It's that white look that you're looking for, the bright white look. Now, I will say this on the bright white, you want to keep it clean. Uh, what typically happens is on the north side of that fence, wood, this happens with wood, but it happens a lot more uh, in vinyl fence and vinyl siding is you'll start seeing algae growth, right? So it'll start looking a little dingy. They'll start having a green sheen to it, usually in the corners or under the top rail on the north side. Uh, you'll start getting some algae growth, which is super easy to take care of. Uh, we use, so we clean fence too here uh, in the Midwest, but well, we, we use an algae side where you apply it, it dries out, it kills it on contact, dries out the root system, and you're done. You rinse it off, 
with with low pressure. It's a soft wash system, and you're done. Uh, but a lot of people don't want to invest in the equipment, and I don't blame you. So from a homeowner's perspective, uh, so if you're one, if you've got a dirty fence, you've got a fence that has mold or algae growth, um, 50, 50 mixture with, with bleach, um, bleach, the key active ingredient is sodium hypochlorite, which is the key active ingredient in our algae side. And what you would do is you would take that bleach and take a two gallon container, mix a gallon of the bleach. Now wear where the proper safety attire, wear gloves and glasses, I mean, bleach can harm you. Uh, but a gallon of bleach and then a gallon of water, because typically this bleach is coming in at about 6% sodium hypochlorite, and you want to get it down to about 3%. So mix it half and half with water, shake it a little bit, spray it on. Typically, typically we would wait until, you know, it, it bleaches out whatever we're, whatever we're applying to. So the mold or the algae, typically it's algae, um, 10 to 15 minutes is pretty, con pretty consistent, uh, pretty adequate. Now. Sometimes, you know, sometimes that active ingredient hits the first layer if it's a really dense or thick algae. And so you'll come through, you'll rinse it off, and you'll notice, hey, there's still some here. Reapply. It doesn't matter that you've already rinsed it off. Wait a minute, reapply it, let that work on the new layer, rinse it off, and you usually should be good. But but Samaritan did not ask me how to clean fence, asked me about vinyl. I like vinyl. Um, I think it looks great. We don't install it simply because there's a couple companies here in town that do install a uh, factory direct vinyl. And so their quality for the price point, is not really a product that we can compete with, uh, especially right now. So vinyl fence material, uh, from what I, when I'm talking to other fence companies, vinyl fence material is also in a shortage scenario too, to where it's getting harder and harder to come by. So, uh, yet another reason we don't install it, but, uh, but for years we haven't simply because, uh, the two competitors use factory direct, which is fine. It's nice quality stuff, but, uh, yeah. So my preference personally is wood only because that's what we install, but there's a lot of nice vinyl fences out there to really think the, the, really the key thing here with vinyl fence is just do your homework in the manufacturer of it. Um, uh, you know, what, what quality materials do they use? You know, is it, uh, just, is it, I like to see, you know, to Mark's point earlier, I like to see a domestically produced vinyl. I mean, there's several. There's actually a handful of manufacturers here uh, domestically that manufacture it uh, just simply because, you know, there's a little bit more uh, accountability from a domestic manufacturer. Um, yeah, kind of go from there. Dylan Blancs says, new to the channel, Dan Black and I and I are the fence king. Absolutely, Dylan. So I'm guessing, are you uh, are you Dan's son, Dylan? Are you the, uh, the future king? So... Would you be the fence, fence prince? Hey, that's got a ring to it, right? Uh, yeah. So Dan's really good people, Dylan. I uh, D Dan and I have had several good conversations. I really like what he's up to there in the South. You know, him him and I are, are kind of from the same frame of mind in that you know we're trying to build good quality fence, and but we're also trying to help the industry out as much as we can. Uh, I tell you, I'll tell you this about fence king marketing is on point. You know, you guys, you guys do some really good marketing. I really like what you're up to. Uh, if you guys are in the South, you should look up Fence King. Uh, if nothing, uh, even if you're not from the South, you should look up Fence King on Facebook and check out their marketing because Dan and his guys are phenomenal at, you know, putting the best foot forward to the customer and making sure they really understand the values that Fence King stands for, you know, the quality that they can expect when Fence King gets on the project, that sort of thing. I really like what those guys are up to. All right. Ryan has a great question. Uh, would you recommend making gates out of, out of wood or a metal kit, like a just a gate always metal. And, and here's why. So we've used wood gate frames in the past. We've, we've stick built our wood gates in the past. Uh, but the problem there is no matter, no matter how well you build it, it's always, it typically is always going to sag, you know, and we've tried over engineering these we've tried, you know, spending a ton of time just making sure we get everything just right and all the cuts just right and using probably more material than we should just to try to brace and cross brace and you know and it never seems to be a good long-term solution since we switched to using now we manufacture our own we fabricate our own steel gate frames but to your point adjust a gate are also good because the metal itself is not going to sag or warp or twist whereas a wood gate frame could so my opinion is 
you know, for long term durability, a steel gate frame is is always going to be is always going to be our choice. Um, yeah. So with using the fence, I mean, the hardware I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the shark hardware from Forney Fence, we so we use two and a half inch CS forty posts, so a substantially thick post, and then the shark hardware that attaches directly to the steel post. And we fabricate our own gates, and it attaches directly to the gate. On the other side of the gate is your is your latch, and it attaches itself again directly to the gate. The 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 striker bar does. The latch itself ties directly to your latch post, your steel latch post. Again, on the latch post is a CS forty post. Is that overkill? It is, but here's why: is so before we were using CS twenty posts on our latch because the latch post really isn't carrying load right so it's it in a lot of in a lot of instances it's in the middle of a line it is holding the fence up but it's not carrying a lot of you know it's not carrying a lot of load that needs to brace itself not like a hinge post right where it's trying to really bend this post over and it's holding up a latch so we use to cs20 post the problem is at six o'clock in the morning and of course right now when we're in winter daylight hours it's darker in the morning and so a CS20 post looks a lot like a CS40 post. We tried painting the bottoms orange. We tried, you know, putting them in completely different racks and it never failed. Once in a while, a helper would grab a CS20 post and throw it in a hole and not even think about it. Or we had that come up a couple of times. Another few times came up that we hung the gate. The client loved it. They use it for a little while. Then they called back and said, you know what? It opens to the left, but I would sure like this thing to open from the right. It's just, it would work better for, you know, insert reason here. And the post that we use on that latch post is, is a CS20 post. It's not thick enough. It's not heavy enough to hold that gate frame straight and true. So thus CS40 post on both the latch and the hinge is overkill. It is, but it works. It works for us. So steel post, steel hardware, steel gate frame is absolutely my go to because then when you do that we offer a lifetime warranty on our gates and it's something no one else does i mean show me anyone else that offers lifetime warranty on gates nationwide when you look at when you look at surveys nationwide number one reason for callbacks on a fence is gates the gate sags it drags it warps it twists it's hard to open or hard to close the gate doesn't work correctly number one callback so we started using steel posts and steel gate frames and even then we kind of did the industry norm one year warranty until I sat, we and one of the wood crew chiefs was sitting kind of chatting and I was like, you know what? These warranty calls on gates, how many of them are more than a year out? He's like, well, you know, since we switched to the system, maybe a handful a year or more than a year old. Okay. Are we charging them? I said, no, of course not. No, it's a gate we installed. We just went and fixed it. Okay. So, in essence, we are performing a lifetime warranty. We're only advertising it as a one-year warranty. I think we ought to change that. So we did. So now we offer a lifetime warranty. So if the gate sags or drags or it's hard to open, hard to close, which says it's steel post, it's steel gate frame, steel hardware, it shouldn't. You know, now sometimes, sometimes the gate is left open and the wind grabs it and it slams it open or slams it shut and it brings it out of adjustment. And, and we could say that's, you know, it's improper use of the gate. It's not, the gates not, you know, hard to open or hard to close because of anything we did or anything the hardware did, it got left open. It was misused. So could we say that we didn't cover it? We could probably, but the thing is the client expects that, right? They said, you know, I know they told me that the warranty covers, you know, their installation methods and the materials and on and on. So they probably don't cover this, but I'm going to call and I'm just going to see if they'll do it. You know, I'm not going to tell them the wind slammed it. I'm going to tell them this thing's just, you know, boy, it's kind of hard to open and kind of hard to close. And I don't know what happened when, when you, when you walk up to a gate, if you've seen a gate before that had wind damage, you know exactly what you're looking at. Uh, so anyway, the customer is expecting you not to warranty this. So when you warranty it you say, Hey, you know what? I think I know what happened. You know, I think, you know, when I see a lot of these gates, I really think what happened is the wind probably grabbed this thing and you probably actually didn't even realize it probably happened overnight when you were sleeping, but the wind grabbed this thing and slammed it open or slammed it closed, just brought it out of alignment. But don't you worry. 
I went ahead and adjusted it. I'm still writing this up as a warranty call. It's a lifetime warranty. There's no charge. Is there anything else I can look at on the fence while I'm here just to see if you know any other warranty issues are needed? I want to make sure I handle this for you while I'm here. I'll talk about a customer experience because that customer fully expected you know, my service tech to look at that gate and say, hey, now, wait a minute. This isn't covered. This is a service call and here's your bill. But no, we'll warranty it because, I mean, honestly, the, the perception of that and the goodwill that we purchase by not charging them a fee is worth way more than the cost of that service call to our company, worth way more than the mileage on the vehicle, than the, I mean, a fence gate, a fence, fence gate, a gate adjustment takes 20 minutes, maybe, like if we're really taking our time. So 20 minutes plus, I mean, maybe you calculate drive time back and forth, but typically, you know, warranties are taken care of. Usually what we'll do is once a week, typically on Wednesdays, we'll perform all our warranty calls. But anyway, the cost of that is far outweighed by the goodwill that you purchase. Because then what I imagine in my head is then there's a conversation between this customer that didn't expect for this to be warrantied, but it was. This customer is talking to someone else. And they're like, you you know, this someone asked for a recommendation, you know, usually on Facebook anymore, asking about fence. And this person is going to absolutely recommend us because they're like, hey, you know, not only do these guys have a good warranty, sometimes, you know, if I forgot to leave my gate closed, I forgot to lock it or whatever. You know, these guys really stand behind their warranty. And not only do that, they kind of go above and beyond that warranty. That is at if that one customer leads to another sale because of what th we, the, the benefit absolutely outweighed the cost long rant. We absolutely recommend making gates out of metal kits. Uh, I'm not familiar with adjusted gate. I've seen how they work. I'm familiar with kind of the concept of it. I, if you can, you know, so if you can purchase a pre-made gate from, you know, fence contractors typically sell them in your area or, uh, or, you know, a lot of times, so there's fence contractors in our area. We're one of them that sells them, but there's also uh, some metal shops, some uh, welding fabrication shops that also sell uh, steel gates where they can make steel gate frames. I would probably go that route before I went the adjusted gate, but uh, if all this fails, the adjusted gate would be my preference over just a standard wood frame gate. All right, long rant, but here we go. Or that wasn't a long rant, but here we go. So Dylan is a son of the fence king. So Dylan, we are now crowning you the fence prince there i hereby declare it dylan is now the fence prince um I, and i like the ring of that here's the thing dan if dan if you're still watching fence king still watching you should absolutely start a youtube channel i would love to to collaborate with you i would like to take some of the discussions that you and i have had privately and share them with with my community because i think there's a lot of value there and i think you have a tremendous uh, a tremendous voice that can, uh, that can, uh, voice of the people. I don't want to say voice of the people. What am I trying to say? You speak in a way that a lot of people will understand and you have a lot of good things to say. So, but if you do that, then Dylan, you should, you should be the fence prince. I'm telling you right now. I think that's, uh, I think that'd be a good idea. So Samara says, uh, can you still get the bright white look for wood? If so, how would that be achieved? I was all in on vinyl until seeing some of your videos on how custom your projects look. Yeah. So, you know, that's going to be the downfall of vinyl is that, you know, it comes in kits, uh, not pre-assembled by any means, but it comes in kits to where you can't really custom contour it. You know, you can, uh, so vinyl typically comes in either six foot or eight foot sections, eight foot in our area is a little bit more common, but you could get six foot sections, but even if, so if you're in an area that has uh, varying terrain, you could still kind of get the roller coaster look if it's only every six to eight feet when you're coming up and over or down and up. Um, yeah, so wood wood's a more custom look. But the thing is you can you get a bright white look? I suppose so. You could probably use an exterior paint, but knowing what I know about Fence Stain, you know, we use uh stain seal experts out of Nashville. I really like those guys. And in talking with Caleb, when I when when I was getting into staining fences and I, I literally knew nothing about staining, you know, the 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 conversation about paint came up. The problem with paint is it doesn't it doesn't uh, penetrate into the the wood material. It stays on the surface. Now it might penetrate the first layer or two layers, uh, but it doesn't really soak in like a good like a oil based sealant would. Uh, so you, what you typically see is bubbling, cracking, flaking, that sort of thing. Typically, you know what you see in 
20, 30 year old white picket fences. You know, we've got some of those in our area and, and they all, they all flake and peel. And you see guys out there with brush wire brushes, you know, scraping it off and repainting it, you know, once a year, once every other year. I mean, can you do it? Sure. But it is an incredible amount of maintenance. Um, yeah. So it's, it's kind of rocking a hard place though for you, Samaritan. So just because, you know, vinyl's not as custom to the job site as wood would be, uh, but you can't get that, in my opinion, I mean, you can get the bright white look, but at the cost of a significant amount of ongoing maintenance. And for me, that would outweigh it. You know, vinyl's, excuse me, excuse me, I'll grab another drink. So vinyl's main, uh, main benefit is lack of maintenance. Uh, just vinyl itself isn't going to rot. It's not going to warp or twist. Uh, you know, if good quality materials used and all that, but so, you know, it's a, a, I think, you know, they kind of marketed it as maintenance free. It's not really maintenance free just because uh, you need to keep the North face of that clean. Uh, but yeah, so you're not only is a wood fence painted white, not, not only does it have the regular maintenance that a wood fence would, I mean, it is still eventually, uh, the post will still rot at some point. Uh, no matter if it's treated pine or cedar, or redwood, you know, whatever post you use at some point, they will rot. Uh, you see, you still have that ongoing maintenance, but then once you paint it, you can guarantee yourself, you're going to be out there scraping and repainting it every year to two year or, or not, you know, or you could look really great, you know, right away. And then over the years, it starts becoming, you know, less great and less great. And then at some point it just doesn't look that great at all. Um, yeah. So really that's going to be the, that's going to be the trade-off is do you want it to look completely custom to the yard or do you want it to be significantly lower maintenance? I won't say maintenance free cause it's not, but uh, significantly lower maintenance. That is the question. All right, guys. So I see, uh, I see your subscriber count counting that mean or subscriber count climbing. Uh, that means some more of you are joining us. Welcome. I appreciate you coming into the broadcast. Let us know who you are and where you're from. Uh, and then I'm open for any sorts of questions, fencing business or otherwise. All right. Ryan's got a question. One more for you. We're doing a board on board look using eight inch cedar pickets. Uh, side note, I love eight inch cedar pickets. I wish I could get them reasonably priced. Uh, we used eight inch. So what, I mean, technically seven and a half inches, eight inch nominal. Uh, we used those eight inch po or eight inch pickets for quite a long time. And I love them. It's a great look. Uh, and our guys love them because it's less, uh, pickets per foot. Uh, so it's less pickets to carry around a yard. Anyway, uh, should we keep the rails visible on the outside or the inside of the fence? Not sure if there's a fence etiquette rule, Ryan, there's not, here's my thought on this is, and actually this has kind of been a point of contention in the comment section of several videos, uh, that we've done. I prefer finish side out. It's a nice finished look. I think it looks great, you know, for everyone driving. The curb appeal is much higher when the finish side is facing out. Now, when I said that, and I don't even remember which video it was, but I certainly remember the comments when they said, you know, you are absolutely robbing your clients because the finish side should be in. That's the side that they see over and over. That's the only view they have. And you're going to give the people that paid you money the structural view of the fence, you know, that's absolutely wrong and on and on. I get it. So I, I say that to say it's probably going to be regionally, it's probably going to vary regionally, you know, depending on what part of the country or the world you're in. Uh, my preference is finish side faces out because I think it's a much cleaner look from the curb or from your neighbor's perspective. Now, are you going to see the structure? You are. Somebody has to, you know, I mean, unless you're going to double side a fence, which is, you know, if you're using steel posts, it is an option. Um, unless you're going to do that, someone, someone will see the structure. Someone will see the horizontal rails. Uh, I would prefer, well, in, in my fence, the finish side faces out and I, I've got neighbors that already had fences. I could have faced them in. That would have been fine. I'm sure. Uh, but I faced them out. I think it's a much cleaner look. I would prefer my, my house to have really nice curb appeal from the outside, but teach their own. So is there a fence etiquette rule? No. Um, but so one thing I will say is sometimes though there are uh, HOA, so homeowners associations or POA property owner associations, 
uh, rules. Sometimes there's, well, yeah, sometimes. So there's uh, there's one municipality in our area uh, that does require finish side out. Um, some of the some of the neighborhood, the HOA POAs, um, some of them do require out. A lot of them say that you have to, if the fence has already been started, you have to finish it in the same manner. So in a consistent manner, meaning that, so if you're the yard behind you has fenced their, what is your backyard, um, then, you know, and they face the fence side out towards you then your remaining sides have to be faced in. So it all looks consistent it, with the exception being the part that faces the road. Those are pretty much consistently always facing the road. Um, but yeah, so probably check if you have an HOA or a POA, check with them, see what their regulations are. Check with your, typically with your city or local government, you'll have to get a permit anyway. Uh, check with them on what rules they might have. But if you're asking me my opinion, I prefer finish side out. Can it be the other way? Yes, but... One guy's opinion, right? All right. So, guys, we're looks like we're that's about it for the questions. I tell you what, I have a scheduled for another little while here, though. So, if you guys have questions, be sure to drop them in the comments below. Um, yeah. So, let me see here. So I, I actually, I absolutely did not write down enough questions from you guys uh, from our comment section. Uh, let me scroll back through and see see if we missed any questions up here. These were going pretty quick there for a while. Like I said, if you guys are new, uh, drop me a comment. Let me know where you are from and who you are and where you're from so we can say hi to you. Yes, it looks like we're, uh, looks like we're, looks like we're fairly caught up. If you guys have a subject you'd like to talk about, I'd also do that. I am uh, fairly good at ranting on about a subject. If you have one that uh, interests you, I'd certainly be happy to talk about it. I'll tell you what, my contacts are absolutely messing with me. I don't know if it's allergies or it's probably the fan drying them out, I would bet. I'm actually looking into LASIK surgery uh, just because more and more often my contacts are just not cooperating. But it's also changing the season. So winter's coming, and it gets uh, significantly drier out. All right, yep, we're caught up on questions. So, um, yep, so this week's video, it actually came out yesterday. If you guys had a chance to watch it, was about insurance. Uh, I interviewed Blake Wigson with uh, PJC Insurance. What was that? It was a month ago or so. I did it live here on the channel on a Tuesday morning. Um Yep, we did that, and then uh, so we talked about commercial insurance uh, because here's the thing: is a lot of I don't want to say a lot of guys. You see, you see some companies that say licensed and insured, but you're pretty sure they don't have all their insurance, right? So licensed and insured, insured for what? You know, you you look at it, you're like, you know, I almost wonder if they're saying they're insured because they have vehicle insurance. You know, maybe maybe they have product or maybe they have. Uh, Liability insurance, general liability. Maybe they have workman's comp. They probably don't have an umbrella policy. One thing, one conversation that we got into though, towards the end of that was uh, EPLI, Employment Practices Liability Insurance, and uh, it's a coverage we have. And Blake and I had talked about it just briefly when uh, when he and I were going over a policy in the past, but I hadn't talked to him in in depth about it. So what that is is so say as it. Well, one of the things is for is wrongful termination. So wrongful termination being if they feel like they were, um, if they feel like they were fired for no reason or, or fired for an improper reason, maybe, or they were treated bad, you know, some policy, uh, you know, some policy in your company gave them a hard time, made it harder for them to work or made them feel uncomfortable at work. Uh, they could absolutely, they could sue you for that, especially especially now as we're, you know, as we're dealing with the impacts of the pandemic, the, the COVID or Corona, whichever you'd like to call it, um, you know, what is the policy on how long you have to stay home? Uh, but when, before you come back to work, do you need a, do you need a te negative test result? Do you need multiple negatives or do you need a negative and then wait a certain amount of time? Um, 
do you have to stay home if you have symptoms or does it have to be a positive result, you know, on and on. Uh, so, you know, what every company's policy is probably a little bit different just because it's custom to their situation. Uh, but if someone feels that they were, you know, treated wrongly due to that policy, they could, they could, and they're, you know, typically, typically it's not while they're still employed. Typically it's after they've left, uh, they could bring a suit for, you know, wrongful termination or some sort of, uh, some sort of suit about how they were treated during employment. And so that's where the EPLI, the employment practices, liability insurance comes from. And so basically that is to, to specifically protect you against lawsuits like that of just pra employment practices is exactly like what it sounds. Um, I was really interested to talk to him about that. And actually after the interview, we talked a little bit more, um, about limits, policy limits, and maybe making sure that we had enough coverage there and maybe increasing our coverage a little bit, not because of how we do things, but just because it is a crazy world out there and, and you never know, you know? So I, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like we're really in for some wild times in regards to employment practices with, and how, uh, how the pandemic is handled by a company, uh, just because there's no real guidance, right? Specifically, like I said about, you know, so if someone shows symptoms, but they haven't tested positive, do they still stay home? And while they're staying home, are they paid? Uh, you know, if they've, someone they've come in contact with, you know, has tested positive. So the local health department reaches out to them and says they are to be quarantined for the 14 days or whatever the period is. Um, is that paid or is that unpaid? When do they come back? Do they have to have a negative test result before they come back? So I've talked to friends who's, you know, whose businesses, some of them, you know, the businesses they work for, <clears throat> some of them say you have to have a negative test result before you come back which then get into the whole, then you get into the whole conversation about false positives and false, false negatives. Um, or some of them say you have to have a negative plus X days before you come back to make sure that you weren't just negative at that time point, you know, during the incubation period or whatever. Um, there's a lot of confusion about the employment practices in just that one area. So, uh, definitely something to talk about your insurance agent or your insurance broker about, uh, something that, that we, I, we increased our coverage. Well, so our policy come, our policy renews January one. So we'll probably be increasing our coverage on that, uh, simply because you never know, you know, God forbid something happens, somebody gets sick because they came in contact with someone in the business or someone in the company that they were allowed to come back because they had a negative, but it was a false negative or it was a negative during the incubation. And then they got everybody sick. And then is it on the business because the business did have them come back to work? It's a crazy time. It's a crazy time. So EPLI insurance, you should absolutely uh, check that out. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in the video. If you haven't watched the video, it's it's on our on our page. It uh, it went out yesterday. Ryan says he is in Fallon, Nevada. Lots of dry heat out there. I bet. So. Uh, been to Nevada a couple times to your Las Vegas, um, usually for conventions, but I went out there for a uh, bachelor party or two, with some friends when we were in that age of getting married and all that. Um, I like the area a lot. You know, we did, we kind of did the, you know, we did, the, we didn't do the, uh, the party atmosphere so much as we did the, so you guys out there have like lots of desert, right? And there's a few companies that will let you fire very large, uh, guns, uh, like truck mounted, you know, 50 caliber guns, that sort of thing. So we certainly did that out in your desert. That is very warm. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, welcome from Nevada. So I would imagine Ryan, so your fencing season, uh, probably also, uh, doesn't fall off during the winter, but I would almost bet that it probably slacks off during the summer, uh, similar to, uh, Arizona out there in that, in the summertime, they work in the morning. They usually take off during the day, um, just because it's too hot to work outside. The heat index gets above, you know, everyone has their own number, but the heat index is above 100 or 110. Uh, they have to break until it comes back down below that. Uh, I would think so. You guys are actually kind of a little bit counter cycle in that uh, summer might be a little bit slower season simply because of the weather. I would like to hear back about that though. Mr. Beat says, can you listen to my song on my YouTube channel? You bet. 
I uh, won't do it on this channel, but I will. I'll absolutely listen to it. If you guys want to check out Mr. Beats and his channel, by all means. I haven't listened to it, but anything's worth a shot once, right? The man, Caleb Roth. Appreciate you joining us. So Caleb, uh, Caleb's company is Stainless Steel Experts. That's who we use for our fencing stain. I really enjoy their fencing stain. I actually did a video on uh, the difference between water or water based and oil based stain uh, a few months ago now. And uh, in the in the second part of that video, we talk about stainless steel experts and about why I like their version of oil based. Um, Cliff Notes edition on that, you know, the too long didn't read version is that uh, it's a safer oil based stainless sealant. Um, there's different ways to make an oil based stainless sealant. A lot of them use uh, use solvents and chemicals that have volatile organic compounds in them. Uh, it's typically you can smell them as soon as you open that can up. And anything that smells that uh, that chemically probably isn't good for you to get on you. Uh, Caleb stain, I like it a lot because it doesn't have that smell. They it costs a little bit more because it's safer. It's safer for you. You know, it's a lot like the conversation of uh, you know health food. Health food costs more than McDonald's, right? Because it costs more money to raise it to make sure that it's. Actually, you know, whether we're talking organic, verified organic, or we're talking about whatever we're talking about, let's use organic for instance, you know, to verify that it's organic, to raise it in a way that is truly organic, uh, simply costs more money, right? To produce this certified organic thing. Um, stains a lot the same way, you know, could Caleb use chemicals that are a little bit less expensive, but a little bit more harmful. Sure. You know, a little bit more volatile, volatile organic compound, had a little bit more volatile, VOCs, we'll say that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But but then at the same time, you know, Caleb and I share share a mind in that, you know, I feel personally responsible for, you know, my team members out there using it, right? Or the people that were selling the same too. I, I feel personally responsible for them using that product. And so I wouldn't ask my guys to do something or my gals to do something that I wouldn't do, right? And I don't feel, I wouldn't feel good if I'm using a, you know, a stain and sealant that I know is more dangerous to handle, uh, that sort of thing. So I like their stain and seal a lot. The the brand is literally stain and seal experts. Um, they sell the stain. They were a supplying dealer for them here in the Southwest Missouri, but you can also buy it direct. Uh, Caleb, why don't you drop a link to stain and seal experts in the chat so that uh, if someone is not in my area and they'd like to buy it from you directly, they could certainly do that. Uh, also, so Caleb's website also has a dealer locator to where you can find a dealer close to you and go chat with them. I would usually recommend, I mean, you can buy direct, you absolutely can, but, uh, stopping by a dealer, a St. Seal Experts dealer would then also let you, you know, they have all, the literature of course, but typically you can see examples, you know, in person of the different colors. Uh, that's usually the big thing I, I like to promote is that come by, check out the stain colors because I mean, you know, in the printing process, some things get lost in translation, right? Or sometimes the colors aren't, you know, they might be a shade or two off depending on how you look at them, depending on how they were printed, that sort of thing where I really like folks to come by, see some wood that we've pre-treated or pre-stained um, and get a good feel for the color. So anyway, check out Stain Seal Experts if you're in the market for stain, uh, use your locator. You can buy directly from them or through their dealer network. I like them a lot. Mr. Beats is from Belgium. All right, Mr. Beats, I like it. So what kind of music do you uh, do you produce or do you make, Mr. Beats? Let us know. All right, guys. So, uh, <laughs> okay. We love our dealers, support local business. I agree. I absolutely agree. So, um, Kev, do you have a link for the dealer locator that you could drop in the comments? I mean, I'm everyone out there can obviously use Google uh, to find it, but... Uh, yeah, so use dealer locator, check in uh, with one of your local dealers uh, at the very minimum to at least get comfortable with the stainless steel and to see why, you know, what makes it different than, you know, this, the stainless steel product you could find at you know, your local home improvement store. We'll say that, um, the differences are, are pretty, pretty amazing. All right. Martin says, how do you go about shadow boxing a fence that's surrounded by existing various fences? Would you leave enough space between the neighbors so that you're able to put the boards on the outside? Yeah. I mean, 
Well, it depends on what type of fence it is, right? But typically I would. Uh, typically I would leave enough space between the fence and your fence to where you could walk through and nail them. Uh, you know, I understand the argument too, that you could put it up against a, like a chain link fence and shoot through, you know, your gun could fit through the links on a chain link fence. Uh, but, but maintenance, ongoing maintenance would be a bit of a nightmare on that scenario. Uh, the upkeep on it would be a bit more tricky. So, you know, if it's got to go right there, it's got to go against it probably step in two feet that way at least you can get between it and uh and service it maintain it long term typically what i would recommend what we typically recommend is to go talk to the neighbor and say hey neighbor i am actually thinking about replacing this fence and i'd like to do it with a shadow box fence you know a lot of times or sometimes we'll do that we'll have that conversation for them hey we're we're installing this fence next door would you mind if we took down and disposed of your fence for free and then put this fence in its place uh, that way you don't have two fences right against each other. Once you do that, you're certainly inviting, uh, you know, leaves and debris to collect in there, grass to grow between. It can become unsightly. Would you mind if we just re removed your fence and installed their fence in the same place or, you know, on their side of the property line, uh, that sort of thing. And typically it's, it's better received than you would think. You know, sometimes what happens, you know, call it one out of five or something. Uh, the neighbor says, you know what? Um, I've actually been thinking about replacing that fence. I've, you know, I've, we've been talking about that for a while and they end up going halves in on this fence. It's ha like I said, one out of five doesn't happen every time. Doesn't have a lot, but a lot doesn't happen a lot of times, but sometimes that neighbor's already been thinking about replacing the fence. So, but if the neighbor doesn't want to replace the fence, uh, I would probably step it in two feet. You lose two feet of your property. I understand. And sometimes that's very important to people, but the, uh, the ongoing maintenance would be a bit trickier if it was installed directly against that fence. So great question. Thank you. Solid info and content as always. Thanks for everything that you do. I appreciate uh, you're welcome. I appreciate you guys tuning in with us. I do. Um, I mean, being helpful is why, why we created this channel, right? It's why we record the content and do the interviews and, and uh, put this thing together is so that we can try to be as helpful as possible. And I appreciate you guys tuning in and uh, yeah, helping me bring value to more folks. All right. So guys, let's do this. So Mr. Beat says it's his first song, but nobody's liked it. Why don't you go listen to it? And uh, if you like it, give it a like. Show Mr. Beat some love. All right. Uh, let's see. So yeah. What do you guys want to talk about? Ask me anything quite literally. Let me do this. I'm going to go while you guys are loading in questions. I'm going to go through some of our comments on our YouTube channel and we'll just do it that way. How about that? Of course, answer your guys' questions as you pop them up, but then also talk about comments here. Okay. So this was, uh, this is one of the comments about orange. As we talked about before, for those of you just joining us, we talked about color branding earlier and why I wear orange. There's a whole video about it too. Um, so what, what happens when the local sheriff chain gang cleanup crews come around and that orange outfit you got on gets mixed up with the chain gang crew. I like that one. I gave him a laugh face. I said, love it. Thanks for the chuckle. Here's the thing is like, so that was Kirk Watson. So I think Kirk came from a good place on that one, right? Not all of the comments have come from a good place, but I like it. Let's see. Uh, we talked about Zachary, uh, Zach's question about the nails. Um, oh, let's talk about this. So Zach's, I apologize, Zach. So I didn't get to the second part of that question. Um, he also differentiates between galvanized and stainless, depending on the material. Uh, the question is, where do you guys get your nails? And do you all have other types of nails you use? Yeah. So we talked about where, but we didn't talk about what types. So uh, we use galvanized ring shank and you know, we, so we don't differentiate between, um, between pressure treated and cedar. I mean, we only install cedar right now anyway. Um, but we don't differentiate. We don't use different nails for different materials. Uh, just because in our personal experience, there hasn't been a need to, um, did you say stainless or aluminum? I think you said stainless steel. So I see some guys use stainless, some guys use aluminum nails, um, which both are fine. Uh, yeah. Stainless steel. So here's the thing. So we actually price stainless steel nails and, uh, through through the uh, national supplier and it was almost four times the cost. So it was, 
I want to say a box of nails runs like $108 uh, for 3,600 of them. Uh, the stainless steel for also for 3,600, uh, so stainless steel ring shank, uh, it was like $460 for a box. So four times the cost. Uh, now, I understand it's not a huge, when we're talking about nails, it's it's obviously $100 for 3,600 of them, right? So I get it. Nails aren't a huge component of the project, but it's still four times the cost, right? So we're still talking about a price increase for stainless. And in my experience, in one guy's experience, uh, I haven't seen I haven't seen enough reasons for to try to upgrade to a stainless steel when we're not having problems with galvanized. Um, some guys have ha see issues with bleeding down the pickets. Uh, I think that's well, it could be two things, right? So it could be that the galvanizing was uh, wasn't a maybe a thick enough galvanizing or heavy enough coat. So maybe it got scratched off as it's going through the board. Uh, I wouldn't think that a, that a wood board would scratch off the coating more likely. Probably what it is, is that with a treated pine board, uh, the treatment is probably having a chemical reaction with the, uh, galvanized, whether it's zinc based galvanized or what, uh, we typically don't see that only because so the nails countersink themselves into the board. Uh, so you don't typically see the bleeding in that anyway, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen any rust off. I haven't seen any, any, you know, any nails break and anything like that. Uh, the galvanized process seems to be pretty robust. Um, uh, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything that justifies a, a Forex, uh, price increase. Now, you know, if it were, you know, if, if where you're buying your nails from, if it's a, if it's a closer price difference, you know, if it's not as much, you know, I would probably, I would probably consider stainless if it, if it was a two X or less, uh, cost increase, you know, if we could get those boxes, if we're paying a one Oh eight for a box of galvanized, uh, ring shank, and we could get it for, you know, two twenty or less, uh, that's an interesting, that's probably when we would test it. You know, that's probably when we, because it's all is a portion of this is public perception too. Right. I mean, we get requests for it from time to time. Um, so it'd be a public perception issue and we'd certainly take a look at that. But like I said, for four X, four X, the cost, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't see a reason to, I really don't, but not a justification. I got a couple more questions in here. All right. Is there any extra protection for the part of the post that is below the ground? Yeah, there is. So, um, yeah, so I'm actually drawing a blank here. It's post sleeves. I don't know if that's the name for it. Hold one, and we will look this up live together. Um, so, actually, so it, uh, so Sand Steel Experts actually is the uh, domestic supplier of it, the uh, United States supplier of this particular product. I want to say it's post sleeve. I looked into it briefly, but then we stopped installing... Uh, we stopped installing wood posts. So, Caleb, if you're watching, why don't you? Yeah, post saver sleeve. Okay, there it is. Post saver sleeve. So this is this is a product that I would recommend because, like I said, we looked into this pretty extensively when we were installing wood posts. I like the product a lot. We just don't install wood posts anymore. Um, if you're installing a wood post, though, so what this post lever does is it sits in the uh, and Caleb could probably speak to it a little bit more intelligently than I can. But my understanding is. It sits in the in the aerobic zone of the soil. So you have aerobic and anaerobic, but the aerobic zone of the soil, which is where all your microbes and all the things are going to eat away at your post, right? The 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 what's going to cause rot in your post, any sort of decay, that sort of thing. It sits in the aerobic zone. So what it is 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 exactly what it sounds like. It is a sleeve that goes around your wood post. So in uh, and the thought I get about it, so it's a lot like a heat shrink. So you sleeve it on the post, you apply heat to that post or to that sleeve, and then it and then it shrinks, it heat shrinks onto the post. So it it you know provides a bond to that post. It adheres itself to the post, uh, and that way it keeps all of the you know microbes and bacteria, etc., and onward. Uh, off of the post and it protects it from rot. So it sits below grade deep enough that it gets out of that aerobic zone and then it sits up above the post too. Now, let's take let's take this a step further. Um so so this is let's pause. So 
there's a 20 year post replacement guarantee. So that's the, that's the other thing. So they they stand behind the product too. The post saver company does and cable does too. But it's a great product. Um, it's a warranted product. I liked it, and we were we were headed down the road to uh, to buying it to really coming on board when we switched away from wood posts. So that kind of nullifies that thought. But if you're selling wood posts, absolutely the product for you guys. So also. Uh, post saver in general, they make a, uh, they make a product called post saver that goes around the post. So it's actually, so this is for the above ground portion of your post. It's a, uh, it's an aluminum cap. Uh, maybe cap's not the right word. It's a, it's an aluminum surround for the post to where if you're weed eating, you don't, I mean, everyone's seen the wood post, right? That's the corners are chewed off this thing right at the ground because every time you go to weed eat, you want to make sure you get it all right. So you, you end up chewing through some of that post. Uh, what the post saver does, uh, the post armor does, is uh, is it prevents that from happening. It's aluminum, so it doesn't rust. It is, uh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Fence armor, galvanized steel, wood whacker protection. That is absolutely the that's absolutely the best description I've seen of it. Weed whacker protection, absolutely. Um, so what I re what I recommend. So if you're sawing wood post, I would use those in combination. Right. So one of those products is going to protect the post below the ground from rot decay. One of those products is going to protect the post above ground, uh, mainly from weed eaters or weed whackers. Uh, you want to protect your post all the way around because that's the point of failure on, you know, I don't know what 90%, 95% of posts that fail or right at the ground level. And most of them are for rotten decay or damage. Uh, you know, every time, every time you're weed eating against that thing, you're removing pieces of that post. You're, re you're removing part of the structure that holds that thing together. And eventually, you know, and, and not to mention as you're weed eating against this thing, you're opening it up for even more, uh, rot and bacteria and all that to get in there. Uh, anyway, not a great scenario. So let me flash these back up here again, post saver sleeves for below grade and fence armor galvanized steel we actually think it's just called fence armor but it is galvanized steel weed record protection for above grade uh both those products are products that i was looking into um prior to you know moving to steel post if we're still installing wood post that's absolutely would be what we were offering uh so what and, I, and i'll be completely transparent so what we were planning on doing so we always offered three levels of service when we offered wood post the you know the the value option was treated pine pickets on treated pine rails on treated pine post. Uh, the improved value was treated pine post, treated pine rails on with cedar pickets, and then the lifetime value was cedar pickets, cedar rails, steel post. What we plan on doing is on the improved value offering, just including by default the post saver sleeves and the fence armor. That way, you know, as the name says, it's improved value. Uh, you're now you're not worrying about post rotting. You're not worried about any sort of damage to that post. So if you got if for the, my fencing contractors out there, if you're still installing wood post, that's how I would that's that's how I would uh, display the offerings is a value because sometimes you have value shoppers and that's absolutely fine. They know what they're wanting to get. So value shoppers are fine, but improved value if you're offering an improved value product, uh, you should protect the post with those products. When calculating for materials, how much, if any, extra material do you add on? I've seen figures of 5% to 20% extra for anticipation of defective material or operator errors. Absolutely. My answer is 10%. So uh, we plan on using 10%. So if we're now post, you know, we're using steel posts. So we're not adding 10% to the post. Uh, but if we're talking about rails, so, you know, cedar rails, cedar pickets, we'll add on 10% uh, so that... You know, in the cedar product, in the Western Red Cedar, you don't see that much defect. I mean, occasionally you do. What we do, the reason we carry it, and, and typically we do carry a few extra posts, is you know how often has it happened when you're on site, you have everything laid out, you've already talked with the customer about it once, but then they talk to their significant other, and then they've decided they'd like a little bit more. You know, they'd like just a little bit more. Or when we're finishing out a fence, hey, would you mind just sealing that up over to my neighbor? You know, I, it's, I know it's his fence, but would you mind just sealing right over to it? 
So the ten percent is our is our safety net, right? Is is our way of saying, hey, we're going to have material on the truck so that if one of those comes up, we say, yep, no problem. And we don't charge for it because ultimately it was already figured in the job anyway. Now, if we account for the 10% and we don't use it, typically we issue that back. You know, we show that as a less product installed than build, but more often than not, we use it. But our answer is 10%. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen the same thing, 5%, 20%. I think 20% is a bit extra. Um, but it depends on the product, right? So each contractor knows the product they're installing. So 20%, if you have a product that has defects or, you know, has a, has a 10% to 15% coal rate, you know, that, which would be excessive, uh, then taking 20% lets you be picky, right? So it makes sure it lets you know, you absolutely have all the extra boards you could ever want where it really comes into play. So we pre-stain all of our fencing material. All of this, not all of it, but we offer pre staining as an option for all of the fencing material. Um, so if you're talking about pre staining then that extra 10% could be all the difference in the world. When Because typically we'll pre stain a week before we install the fence, just so we have it on hand and ready to go. And nobody's waiting on it. Uh, so that really, that 10% really comes into play, you know, when, when, uh, you know, when we're laying out the project and then that project grows a little bit because the customer decides they want to go in front of the AC unit instead of behind it, or they, the gas meter, you know, whatever it is, however it is that that project grows, you know, that 10% keeps us covered on that. Uh, yeah. 10% is, uh, is our go-to. So this is interesting. So, uh, Jose says go with concrete all around the base. No need to worry about damaging pickets or posts. Um, so I did a I did a, a uh, reaction video on a post method similar to this. So he used Sonitube to bring uh, concrete up above grade. My only thing with that is I don't know I don't know that the customers would accept that look. Um, I it just is not a great look in in my opinion in one guy's opinion I don't know that that's a great look. And also you know if you bring that concrete up above grade and it sticks out more than two you know, more than two inches off that post, then you're going to have issues with pickets running past it and getting over it. And like I said, I don't know that it looks all that great. Uh, the, the post savers and the fence armor, I think they're a better look, honestly. I mean, teach their own though too here guys, right? Is, you know, if you have a way of doing it that works for you and that has worked for you and that your clients, you know, accept and they like, then by all means, that's exactly what you should do. Right. I'm not, I'm not here to say there's only one way to do it. You know, and in fact, and in fact, in my intro, I make a point to saying it to say, you know, there, there are more than one way there. There's always more than one solution. Uh, these, this is simply my family's way. You know, I say there's always more, more than one, when it comes to fencing, there's always more than one way uh, to perform a task. This is simply my family's version or something to that effect. Um, and that's the truth of it though. Right. Is hardly ever. You know, I'm sure there's some instances where there's only one one way to perform a task, and that's fine. But when we're talking about fencing, I can't think of an instance where there's only one way to perform a task. There's always more than one way. You know, if if I say, you know, we trim two by fours with a battery powered skill saw, a rotary, you know, a, a rotary saw or whatever you want to call them, you'll get other guys to say, well, you should have used a saw saw or I caught a lot of flack in one of the earlier videos saying that we trimmed them with, with a, with a chainsaw because sometimes we do, if that's a tool that's on the truck and we don't have a battery powered circular saw, we come with a chainsaw because we know the, the steel post we use, no one will ever see that edge of the two before. Now, would I prefer it be a nice clean circular saw cut? Absolutely. But there's more than one, one way to perform that task. You know, if, if you were so inclined, actually one of the first reaction videos we did, um, was a young man building a fence at one of his investment properties. And actually, so, uh, he, so that, that video was one of the first reaction videos we did. So this would have been months, like probably close to a year ago. And, um, he, he commented a day or two ago that he was like, Hey, that's me. Like I, I actually did another fence, you know, six months ago and it, it went way better, but anyway, in his video, he he was cutting two by fours with a handsaw. So I mean, there's there's always more than one way to perform a task. Is is my point, Jose? So where you know where you would bring concrete up above grade, 
I probably wouldn't just because if I was a client, I don't know that I would like that look. I don't know that I would accept that. Um, but to each their own is the key here. All right. Caleb, uh, offering out, offering out some help to Jamie, Jamie, if you didn't see this, uh, Caleb's offering you some help there. I tell you what, Caleb is one of the most, you know, giving guys I know. Um, so when we got into staying, honestly, that was probably one of the things that sold me on staying to seal experts was just how much time Caleb took with me to make sure that all my questions got answered to make sure I knew exactly how I was doing it. And actually when we were staining our first fence, uh, I was staining it because I wanted, you know, I wanted to make sure I understood the process. I wanted to make sure my guys understood the process so that when I'm explaining it to clients that I could explain it. You know, to the best of my abilities because I wanted to actually do it and get hands on, but I was incredibly nervous because I didn't Now, The funny thing is this fence was so uh, me and another guy, uh, we buy houses and run them. Then we rent them. We don't, we don't sell them. We just rent them out. Uh, so it was actually at one of my rental houses, one of our rental houses. So like, I guess in this case, like I was technically half the client, but I didn't want to mess it up is the point. And I was nervous about it. So, uh, Caleb actually, uh, he's like, well, just FaceTime me, dude. Like just FaceTime me and we'll talk about it. And sure enough, I was like, I don't, all right. Like if he'll, I don't know if he'll actually do it or not, but we'll see And Sure enough. Like he picks up, he's like, all right, let me see it. And, and he was sitting in his truck. He's like, all right, I'm sitting here. Like, let me see what you're doing. All right, go ahead and spray it. All right, stand back. Let me look at this angle. All right. Well, you need a little bit thicker here, a little bit thinner there, like, but you're doing great. Anyway, I say all that to say Caleb and his team are incredibly helpful. I like, I like those guys a lot. And, and that absolutely sold me on stainless steel experts. I mean, there's, if you, if you've looked at fence staining at all, you know, there are a lot of options out there and there are, there are some options that are, uh, are, uh, more, more prevalently marketed. Maybe we'll say they're just, you know, they're just out in the marketplace. They're, they're just out there more, or they like putting their name out there more. So anyway, there's options is what I'm saying, but you won't find an option to that. That spends more time helping you. Um, actually. So Caleb just, uh, I saw, saw he put in a lot in several of the fence groups. And so he also has a Facebook group called stain and seal, uh, university where you can jump into the page and he's there to help. There's actually a handful of guys in there that have an incredible amount of experience that are all there to help uh, new guys get into it or just help. Even the guys have been in it for a while. They're trying to troubleshoot problems. Anyway, I saw him post in there um, that so he took uh, they got recognition in the uh, fin world fence. Uh, is it called World Fence News anymore? I think it's just called Fence News. Maybe it used to be called World Fence News. Anyway, um, he put on an in person. The point is, he put on an in person uh, Saint Seal University uh, there out, just outside Nashville uh, where. And he didn't charge any, but that, that that's the craziest part of it. Not crazy, but crazy in a good way, right? Is he didn't charge for it for this training. It was it was a day long training where and it started early in the morning and he showed up and they had coffee and donuts ready to go and and everyone kind of got to know each other and then uh then in started the training, right? And so he had several him and his guys showed how they stain, of course, with their product, but they also, you know, gave general tips and tricks as far as you know, what tips to use and how to properly, you know, stain this fence to where you don't cause a lot of overspray and you don't, you know, put it too light. You don't put it on too thick. Anyway, a day chock full of training absolutely for free. I mean, it was, I went to it. It was, it was crazy in a good way. Right. But it's some of the craziest stuff I'd seen that, you know, for absolutely no money, him and his team put on an amazing event that, you know, realistically, I mean, there's other guys out there. If you stay and you know who they are, but you know, they'll put on a conference and, and they'll, uh, they will charge it. They will charge accordingly for it. And, you know, and I don't want to get into the debate one way or the other, but you see, you see some people comment that, that they do these paid trainings that, Hey, you know, you get what you pay for some snotty comment like that about, you know, free trainings. But I tell you what, the value that Caleb Caleb and his team brought in that one day training. I mean, it was, it was at minimum, you know, like a four or $500 training day. I mean, at, at absolute minimum, uh, but him and his team put it on for free. And so kudos to you guys. 
Stay in Seal University. Look it up here on Facebook, or not here. We're also on YouTube, but on Facebook, look it up, uh, and you will absolutely not be disappointed. So, Ryan asked, "Do you pre-stain in shop, or you just sub that out?" So we we pre-stain in house. Um, so actually, we're we're pretty excited. We're about done with it. We're expanding into a new location. Uh, right now, when we're pre-staining, we're pre-staining outside, and you can imagine just how crazy that is. It's obviously weather dependent. So like today it was raining most all the day. It's also cool today. Uh, wouldn't be ideal for pre-staining material. We have a, a, uh, a stain track machine that we've been using and, uh, which makes pre-staining these materials a bit easier, a little bit messier, but a bit easier. Um, we've been using that in the past, but this, the new, the new buildings that we're expanding into actually have a shop that we can do that. So we're, and the, right now, I talked to the fabrication guy a little bit ago. We're actually manufacturing a dip tank uh, to where we can dip all the materials uh, in-house, make sure all every nook and cranny is coated, make sure they're fully submerged, and they get the best coating possible. Uh, but, yeah, to answer your question, Ryan, we do that in-house. Um, some guys some guys sub it out. Um, you know, So we do that in-house. Now, we also have a painting company that we sub out to on uh, the staining, on-site staining. So... You know, if it's uh, it's a fence we put in two, three. If it's an existing fence that need that needs clean and stained, or just stained, someone else saw the fence that didn't pre-stain the fence, they want it stained. We have a painting company uh, that we sub out to. Great guys do great work, and we stained for quite a while. Uh, but one thing we learned was we're really good at doing fence, and we're really busy at fencing. So to try to stop and then stain takes a little bit away from you know our main core business, which is building fence. So we found someone whose main core business was painting and staining, and uh, we partnered with those guys. So, but if we're pre-staining it, we're doing it in-house. Jace Hernandez says, "I'm about to I'm about to be starting my own fence company. Congratulations, first and foremost. It's a big step, but congratulations for taking the step. And I don't have a welder for the steel frame gates. Can I get those made from other fence companies or a fence supply place? Yeah. Other fence companies. Um, so we do that. Um, so there's other fence companies in our area. Uh, they don't have a welder and a fabricator. Uh, so we, we sell the, the steel gate frames that we make. Um, uh, if we, if, if someone wanted to buy them elsewhere, there's also, if, um, you know, some, some steel and aluminum fabrication shops that sell to the public that make things for the public. And so you could certainly, uh, reach out to one of them and see if they would build you the gate frames. It's it's super straightforward. So I'll tell you. So here's our our template. Our measurements are quite literally. Uh, so on a six foot fence, it'll be five foot tall, and then either four foot wide or five foot wide, and then on a four foot fence it would be three foot tall. That way you have six inches above, six inches below. You have your two by four bolted to your steel frame. It doesn't get much easier than that. It's literally four foot by five foot or five foot by five foot or by uh, three foot. So, and then we just, we do our calculations and then we, so we set our post, uh, I'm testing my knowledge on this one, but I believe it's seven and a half inch offset for a single gate and like eight and a quarter inch, I think for a double gate to allow for that hinge in the middle. Um, but yeah, so we just know where we set our post. So if it's a five foot gate, we set them at five foot, seven and a half inch for a five foot single gate. And that way we can honestly tell our customers you're getting a five foot gate because and it's actually going to be a little bit more than a five foot gate the gate frame itself will be five foot and you've got a little bit extra on top of that for hardware so uh but yeah so typically you can find those at a fencing company or you can uh, reach out to any sort of fabrication shop in your area that does steel and aluminum uh, i mean we use steel i don't know of really anyone that uses aluminum frames um but yeah any sort of steel shop so we use galvanized steel it's uh, we use square tube. We use inch and a half in, We use one and a half inch square tube galvanized, uh, and that one and a half inch gives us a nice, a nice amount of surface area to mount that two by four through. Well, our workflow is, we'll cut all the pieces out and then we'll pre-drill the holes. So we know exactly. We have a template where we know exactly where those hinge holes go. We know exactly where uh, the latch holes go or the striker holes, depending on whether it's a single or double gate. Um, yeah, we apply the template, we pre-drill the holes, and then we'll fabricate it all together, uh, knowing that then we don't have to have this unwieldy five foot by four foot square that we're trying to somehow get into the drill press and drill these holes. It makes it so much easier to pre-drill that material. Just a pro tip for you. And I'm sure everyone probably figured that out. But anyway, 
Um, yeah, so I don't know of a Fin Supply. Um, well, no, that's not true. So Fin Supply Company. So Forney Fence that sells the gate hardware, uh, I believe they also sell an adjustable uh, steel frame. Actually, I'm, I'm fairly certain about that. So I, um, we talked to, they, they uh, brought that up a few times ago on a service call or uh, just a sales call. And uh, we let them know that we fabricate our own. But yeah, so I think he had said that they do make a, uh, a square tube adjustable steel frame. So uh, yeah, but the hardware, you need to go to Forney Fence anyway to get it from. Uh, they're the, they hold the patent for the hinges and the latches, uh, but they also sell the gates. Great question. So Jace, starting out your own fence company, I would love to talk to you. Uh, if you've got a few minutes, you've got a little bit to stick around. Uh, we're going to be on here for, I said 530 for a hard out, but it's not a hard out. I said 530 as an end time, but I'd like to talk to you. Uh, if you've got any more questions about a fence company, because, because guys and gals like yourself that are starting out fence companies are absolutely one of the main reasons I started this channel. Um, because there's so many, is there so much out there that you, that, that you, you haven't come across yet, right? There's a lot out there that you just, you don't know what you don't know. I would absolutely love to help you as much as I can. If you've got questions, drop those in, uh, we can make this a J show and I'll absolutely help you as much as possible. Recommendations on where to find or who to talk to for some training in Atlanta, not just for staining, but all things fence. Yeah. So staining, uh, absolutely stainless steel experts. Um, uh, so they, they offer, they've already offered for this year, uh, their in-person training and actually, so Caleb, if you're still watching, I believe, uh, weren't there some guys from Atlanta, from the Atlanta area that came up? I'm almost certain I'm on that. I, that I talked to some guys from Atlanta, uh, at that training, um, almost certain. So anyway, the in-person training, but so St. Steel Experts University is actually on Facebook. So they have a group on Facebook and, and this group is all about helping others, helping folks that are new getting into the industry, or like I said, guys, uh, guys and guys have been in it for a while and that have, you know, are facing some, some sort of problem, help them to get over it or simply just improving on the techniques. So, uh, start with stainless steel, stainless steel experts, stainless steel university, uh, I believe it's just Stainless Steel University on Facebook. Start there and then um, start there. Then we'll, uh, for the fence, so that's for fence staining. Uh, for fence installation, the American Fence Association, uh, so this year's obviously wonky, right? Uh, they were planning, so, and hopefully when we get through this next year, uh, next summer, they'll put it back on the road. They were going to take a AFA Fencing University on the road. And they were, and so they have a fence installation school. They have fence sales school. Uh, they have a, 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 a business school that talks about running a fence business, which is, as we talked about in the beginning of the live is, I think it's incredibly important. Arguably, you know, the craftsmanship and the business sense go hand in hand in making a great contractor or a contracting company. So, uh, check out the American fence association. Uh, they also do, they also do training at fence tech. So fence tech's coming up in February. Uh, when I talked to Tony, uh, when we did the interview, when did we do that interview? Uh, maybe about a month ago. Um, that's, that's kind of my unit measure for everything. It's about a month ago, but I think it was about a month. Um, when I talked to Tony, it fence tech still on. Now there are going to be restrictions and, and rules and, you know, temperatures as you come in and you wear masks when you're there and you maintain distance that we're all familiar with. Uh, but fence tech is still going on. So typically at fence tech they have. So I think arguably the, the most valuable part of fence tech is going to be, uh, the educational series to happen before or during I say before or during. So it's usually a day or two before the show floor opens for fence tech. Um, and then typically they have trainings kind of throughout the uh, one, the trade shows open, the trade floors open. Um, but I believe there's uh, actually, I don't believe that they're still having those. So check out AFA American fence association, uh, check out the educational series they have at fence tech. So that's coming up in February, just a couple months away. Uh, and then watch for next year. They're going to take their, uh, the fencing university on the road. Um, you're in a big enough market. I bet, uh, I bet it's going to be coming pretty close to you. Here in Southwest Missouri, the uh, closest one to us is going to be in Nebraska. So uh, me and my guys and gals are going to load up and drive to Nebraska to go to some training. So Jace, um, can you contact me by phone? Probably not the best idea. 
only because so like usually I'm either doing this or I'm pre-recording content or or I'm spending time on site with my guys. Like that's the whole other side of this is like I still I still manage I manage a fence contracting company. Um, so I, while I would love to spend time with you on the phone, finding a time to where I could where I could devote time directly to your questions would probably be tricky. But there's a solution here. One questions in here. Two, we I have a Facebook page. I have a it's facebook.com forward slash the real Joe Everest. It's my public facing page. Uh, it's literally the same picture that's on my YouTube channel. It's on my Facebook page. I also have a personal page. I don't accept friends requests from guys and gals I don't know because that's where I have pictures of my kids and my wife. And while I know you guys and I love interacting with you guys, that's personal. And I don't know that it's fair to the folks in my personal life that I invite folks from my business life into that. So I have a public page, the real Joe Everest. You can post all of your pictures, there, questions, comments, videos, whatever in the, uh, in the discussions portion of that page. And I would love to help you there, uh, or simply drop comments in the, in, in here or any of my videos, because I mean, honestly, this is how I find content to produce for you guys is questions just like this. Now this, this live that we're doing now, we're doing these every Thursday. Now, this is the first Thursday that we've done it every Thursday from three to five 30 central standard time in the United States. We'll be doing an ask me anything live. So I would also love to answer any and all of your questions here. So we'll go from there. All right. I tried to join FA, but having trouble on their website for membership. Uh, okay. So no, do this. So, um, uh, check out my live interview with Tony, uh, Tony Thornton is the executive director of the American fence association about a month ago. I uh, said, so look at my content and then go to lives. Uh, it's in there. Uh, and the only reason I say that is because Tony left his email address in that, and we have it linked in the description. He also talks about, I also, uh, I'm working on going through all of my videos and putting chapters in. So, and that's just important because then you can scroll to the part of the video you want to watch, click on that part and just watch that. So Tony talks about his contact info in the video. We also put his email address in the comments below, uh, that, e that, uh, video. And he was very clear that if anyone had any questions, comments, or concerns were, uh, in regards to the AFA, they should reach out to him directly. Um, in, in my few conversations with Tony, I can tell you, he is a guy that absolutely wants to help everyone as much as possible. Uh, so I would encourage you to email him and tell him just that, Hey, Tony, I'm trying to join the AFA, uh, but I'm having some issues on his website, on your website. I would almost guarantee a phone call back from him fairly shortly. Uh, and he would probably help you sort that out personally. Uh, he's that kind of guy. No problem, Noah. I appreciate you guys joining us. Well, guys, we're coming up on 5.30, and which is kind of our kind of our designated stop time unless uh, unless we start getting content, and then we'll take this a little bit long. Uh, I don't mind that as long as we've got stuff to talk about. If not, I'll probably go home and play with the kiddos and have dinner with the family. But but if there's, uh, if there's content to talk about and there's things I can help with, then we'll stay a little bit longer. Uh, so we've got about four minutes left. I know we're on a bit of a delay here, so I'll ask you guys – uh, last kind of last call for questions. I don't know about last call. Cause like I said, we can go long if we need to, uh, five is just kind of a designated, uh, stopping time here in about four minutes. Uh, yeah. So let's do last call. So, um, guys, I'll tell you what, I can't, can't say thank you enough for joining me. Let me see. Uh, so let me pull up the live stream real quick. Um, so, so at the time, we had 19 concurrent viewers was our, uh, t was our top time or is our most concurrent viewers. And I appreciate that a lot. 239 folks have, uh, stopped by to view this. And I appreciate that a whole lot. I uh, appreciate you guys for stopping by. Like I said, if you got questions, uh, any last questions, comments, drop in the comments below. I'd, uh, I'd always be happy to help you guys as much as possible. Until then, I'm going to get another drink. I'll have to bring a bigger cup next time. About out of water. Anyway, like I said, not a sponsorship, just happened to be where I ate lunch today. So, yeah. Actually, that's not true. That's where I had breakfast. I had, that was my water left over from breakfast. So for lunch, I'm, uh, I'm involved in this group called Sertoma, which is service to mankind. And, uh, our mission in Sertoma as an international group is to help, uh, with, ch with, uh, children's hearing or I get hearing in general, but mainly children's hearing. Uh, so once a week we have a lunch together to, 
formulate new and exciting ways to try to generate uh, revenue to try to help that mission or new ways to just basically new ways to help it. So that was where I had lunch today for everyone out there that was wondering. Because there might be somebody from Satoma watching this like, hey, Joe, I know you didn't have lunch there because I saw you at lunch and I had lunch with you today. So if that's you, then yes, that's true. I did have lunch with you. But I did have breakfast at the other place that I, whose cup I had. All right. So it looks like, uh, looks like no more questions, comments, concerns. So Jay, seriously, um, seriously, send me, find me on uh, Facebook, facebook.com. Here, I'm going to type it out. So it's face. Let me turn this around so you guys will hear me. Okay. It's facebook.com forward slash the real Joe Everest. Boom. So that's my Facebook group. And I made it exclusively for you guys to ask your questions, post your comments, I specifically post videos and pictures. Cause a lot of folks want to do that, but you can't do that in my YouTube communities tab. Uh, so we create a Facebook page just for that. Uh, we do have a question. Noah's got to follow up. You recommend airless sprayer for staying fences. Absolutely. I use a, uh, Graco, I believe that thing's a 395, uh, airless sprayer. Uh, I, there's also a uh, Titan makes an airless spray. That sounds like a lot of the guys like to use. Uh, we use a Graco. I like it. It's uh, the 395 is pretty easy to clean. It's a good, it's a good entry, uh, airless sprayer. It's not fancy. It's not the biggest one in the world. You can't run, you know, quarter mile hose off of it. You can't run two or three guns off of it, but it's a great unit. It's a unit that, uh, it's a good entry unit to get started with it. It's not a huge investment to get into. Um, yeah. Graco makes it really nice, but yes, I do I do recommend an airless sprayer. You know, I see guys, you know, try to paint and that that's one way to do it. It takes quite a long time to do it that way. Um, also see guys with, um, with kind of pump up sprayers that also works. The only problem is the droplet size is a lot larger on a pump up sprayer. And so it's more likely to cause overspray and get onto things that you don't want stain on, such as the house or a car or something like that, you know, concrete sidewalk or patio, that sort of thing. Uh, airless sprayers, it's a lot finer droplets. It's more like a mist. So it's not as likely to get grabbed by the wind because the droplets aren't as big and uh, it's easier to control in general. So yes, airless sprayer. And I prefer a gray coat model. So do you even offer installing those plastic home depot fences? We don't No. Um, in general, all right. So, in general, we don't we don't install um, that quality material. Like, I guys, I'm trying to find a, a uh, you know the right way to say that is you know have we used materials from home home improvement stores before? Absolutely. Um, do I prefer to? No, because typically, typically they are what you would call like value engineered. Uh, quality. So they're trying to find the lowest priced way to make a certain good and, and send it to market. And that's not always the highest quality. You know, typically you're going to give up quality to try to save cost, uh, which is kind of where the home improvement stores are at. Like that's their business, right? Is to sell these materials for as much as they can while paying at the least amount that they can. Um, so no, no, to answer your question, Ryan, uh, we don't, we don't install you know, home improvement, uh, materials generally I say, and here's why I say generally. So I don't want, I want to be completely truthful that in the past we have used, uh, in a pinch when needed home improvement lumber from the wholesale side of home improvement stores. Uh, it's a little bit higher quality. It's more expensive, uh, but it has come from a home improvement store. So I don't want to say we don't offer that at all. Um, but we haven't in a while. And we, I don't foresee in the future us installing that. So not typically only, only because of quality, right? If there was a high quality option, then absolutely uh, we would, but typically there's not a great solution, you know, as far as, as far as treated lumber goes. So when I'm in a, when I'm in a home improvement store of any flavor or kind, I like to go through the lumber section just to get an idea for, you know, what's in the retail market of the lumber side. 
and still in the treated pine in ours. And so in our area, we have a Lowe's, Home Depot, and a Menards. And I typically find myself in all three of them at one point in time throughout the week. Um, so I like to go through the lumber section. And it seems like across the board for all three, treated pine, there's still only number two available. And whereas in the past, uh, when we have bought through a, one of those, the wholesale side of one of those, it's been a number one grade. So, and the crazy thing is, it's number two, but it's still four or five times the cost of what we were paying for number one. So not only is it lower quality, you know, and here's the thing too, is like number two, the quality of number two is significantly lower than the quality of number one. The grading number scale is probably one of the best ideas the lumber industry has ever had because number two sounds really close to number one. But if you put the, if you're, if we're talking about pickets and you put one next to the other, they are not close to being the same in terms of quality. So anyway, that's what I'm seeing locally in our market. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put that up only because I know we're going to put our sign on it. And I know that we're going to put warranties in place for that fence. And it wouldn't make sense either from a reputation standpoint or simply from a financial standpoint on warranting that fence uh, on installing those materials. Ryan, if there's one thing you learn about me is I don't take uh, compliments very well. So I'm going to say you're awesome. Thank you for joining. I met with my business lawyers. Very good start. And they have set up my LLC. Absolutely. They are setting up my business account my LLC, in my LLC name and also my business name and the insurance I will need for the company. I think, Jason, I tell you what, you are off to an incredible start because – the, that's, this is what I preach. And one of the things I preach for guys that are starting out is, is put your professional team together before you even get started. And what do I mean by professional team? I mean, you know, your business lawyers. And that's important to say, because not all, not all lawyers, you know, specialize in business law and corporate law. So by having business lawyers, they know, you know, it sounds like in your case, the correct you know, organization structure for your specific situation in your specific state was an LLC. Uh, I'll say this. So ours, ours are an LLC as well, because it makes sense for our situation in our state. Um, I like that the lawyers are setting all this up, the business account and the LLC name and all that, that way everything jives together. Uh, so if they're setting up your LLC name, then they've already checked with the secretary of state to make sure that the name is available and there aren't any conflicts. Uh, that's some place I see that we've experienced guys um, having a misstep is they try to get a name that's too close that's too close to ours. So in our in our case, our you know my family's business name is Ozark Fence, Ozark Fence and Supply, and it has been since 1955. We've traded on that name exclusively and consistently since 1955. And so uh, one gentleman who had worked for us in the past actually started a company called a Ozark fence company. Um, and that was, and, and we came to know that because one of his disgruntled customers called us, uh, thinking that we were him. Uh, so we couldn't, I mean, that obviously can't happen. Right. So it's too close. And then, um, what was the other one? It was and the other one. So then he went on to start another one that was like Ozark's best fence company. Um, which is again, too close to ours. But it, since your business lawyers are already getting you set up with the name, they've already done the research. So good on you. Uh, insurance is incredibly important. So if you haven't already, uh, the video that actually posted yesterday specifically, uh, and specifically talks about contractors insurance. Um, you should watch it, not just because I put it out, but because I think there's a lot of good information in there. He's actually my business's insurance, uh, broker, uh, that, and, and so he knows our business, a fencing business, better than a lot of other insurance agents. So anyway, I think there's a lot of good educational content in there. You should absolutely watch it. Uh, but Jace, I tell you what, I mean, hats off to you, bud, because you, I mean, you're taking so many more steps than, uh, than some guys do, and you're setting yourself up for success, and I absolutely love to see it. Is there a motorized post hole digger that you know of that can be operated by one guy? Well, so um, the mini skid uh, equipment, we talked about that a little bit in the beginning. That would be where I would go with it. Um, so one guy, so uh, we use a Dingo, a Toro Dingo right now. When we go, when we're ready 
to uh, replace that, upgrade it. We're probably going to go to a Bobcat unit. Uh, I've used the MT-85. I've demoed the MT-85. I like it, but they are replacing the MT-85, I believe, with the MT-100. It's either like the MT-100 or MT-110. I haven't demoed that yet just because we're not ready to replace our current equipment. Uh, but one one person can operate one of those um, if you need to. Now, our crews are typically two to three people. Uh, one guy watch, you know, watching the line, making sure that the that the auger stays uh, on point. Uh, but yeah, so any one of those. Now I understand the cost of ownership is absolutely high on those. I think I think they start at forty thousand or something like that. But you can rent them. They are available in our area. Almost every rental house has a handful of these things that they rent out by the day. So they rent them out by the hour. Um, but I would absolutely rent it out by the day. So what I would probably do if you're going to rent one of these is, is schedule several jobs to set, you know, in two or three days. That way you rent this thing for two, three days at a time, knock out all of your holes, then come back around, you know, return it and come back around, start nailing them all up. Um, but yeah, the Bobcat MT, MT 85 is probably what the rental houses will still have or the MT 100. If you're looking to purchase, uh, Bobcat's actually having, uh, I got a flyer in the mail that says, uh, Bobcat's having some pretty, uh, nice financing terms right now. Uh, the, the flyer I got was, I want to say it's like, it was 0%, but I want to say it was like for 48 months or something. Uh, kind of crazy, but, uh, you might check that out. Uh, they also lease those as well. If that's an option for you, if you want to do that. You should show us some of your favorite fences you've ever built. Most extravagant, interesting, et cetera. Sure. Um, we could certainly do that. So I want, what I'm trying to do, let me think how to phrase this. Um, there, there's a, uh, a museum type attraction in our area that has exotic animals. And on the commercial side, we, we, we make pins for them. Uh, one uh, on all sorts of them. We've done everything from, they've got beaver. Uh, they've got a beaver exhibit, a display with some beavers that we've built some pins for. Uh, they also, for this particular company, we've also done like mountain lion cages. So that'd be kind of, ex that can be kind of exciting. But what's really cool is we built uh, raptor pins for them. So they have um, raptors, birds of prey, you know, eagles and falcons and stuff like that. Um, so we built these huge flying runs for them because I mean, these birds need to exercise, they need exercise. And so what they what they do is, so they've got, and I don't know the exact numbers, but they have, I don't know, say, say three of, of one particular bird. So of, uh, of a Falcon, for example, I don't know that they have Falcons, but that's my example. Uh, they have three of them. So at any one time, one of them is in the display is in the exhibit and two of them are in these flying pins. So at any one time, only one of them is is on display at a single time. So that because on dis the displays are very good sized, uh, but they still don't have the flying room that these. I want to say they're they're fifty or sixty foot long flying pins. Um, I think it'd be incredibly interesting to show you guys that. Uh, I'm talking with them. I've been talking with them about coming in. Um, there are some concerns on their side, which are probably justified about. Um, showing too much of what it is and where it is. Um, I mean, there's, there's people in the world that don't, you know, don't like having animals on display. And so they would probably not do great things to, you know, to the pins. Anyway, so I'm working with them, but yes. So zebra, I absolutely agree. Uh, I'm trying to do that. So honestly, we don't do a lot of extravagant fences. Uh, we just really don't. Um, but I think we could show some interesting ones and specifically some interesting animals. Uh, I think that would be pretty neat, but like I said, there's some stipulations that go on with that, that we are, uh, that we are dealing with. Is it Momo scalper says, how do you deal with doing a step down? So what you're probably talking about is a transition, like from a six foot down to a four foot. Uh, in that case, we typically handle it over an eight foot. So our, our sections, when we're talking about wood fence are typically uh posts are eight foot on center. And so from, if one, our last post at six foot, we'll leave it straight six foot. Our next post eight feet over would be at four foot. It would simply run the top stringer down to where it meets up with the top stringer. Our bottom stringer should come pretty close. Well, it should meet the bottom stringer. 
and then that middle stringer typically will bring it over and nail it to, uh, you know, cut it at the angle and nail it to that top stringer so that from visually you just see six, you see six foot transition, four foot. So it's a nice smooth transition. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the, uh, step down transitions. I just think a, I think a, uh, slope transition just looks a little bit more natural. looks a little bit nicer. Um, yeah, that's how we handle them. I don't, I hope that answers your question. If not, let me know. I'd be glad to, uh, to try to try to be more specific. All right. One more question It's five forty-five, and I just missed a call from the wife. So she's probably wanting to know where I am for dinner. All right. What should I wait till spring to stain my fence or does it matter? It does. So here's the thing is it, well, it depends on what type of stain you're using too. So if you're using a, uh, a water-based stain, it has temperature restrictions. You need to read the instructions on the container. Uh, if it's an oil base, there's typically not temperature as many temperature restrictions on oil base as there is on water base. Um, but oil base, you're going to be, you're going to have more stipulations as far as moisture content. Um, I would recommend oil based. We use oil base as a company. I think it's a oil naturally repels water, right? So I think that's a, a smarter solution or smarter, uh, solution. Um, so, but you want to get a moisture meter. So on Amazon, they sell moisture meters for $25, $30 where you can test the moisture. And I say that because in wintertime, I mean, it's in, in our area, in Southwest Missouri, it tends to be a little bit wetter in the winter than it is in the summer. So you want to make sure those boards are as dry as possible. But uh, as to your original question, uh, should I wait until spring? We stain fences throughout the winter as long as, I mean, you have to be smart about temperature, right? Sorry, guys. Um Today, the high was like 48 or 50. So that would have been fine. Now, it rained most of the day, so that wouldn't have been fine. But as far as temperature goes, it would have been okay. Do I do we want to stain fence when it's 20? Probably not. Uh, it just wouldn't be comfortable for our team members. Uh, and I wouldn't want to do it personally, so I wouldn't want to ask someone else to do it. Uh, yeah. So, But should do you have to wait? No. Referred from Noah. Do you do state work or mostly residential jobs? Well, thank you, Noah, for referring Erica to us. Uh, so as a business, we do primarily residential and commercial, uh, we do uh, in commercial industrial. We don't do as much state work. Um, typically, uh, typically state work requires a lot of travel. I personally don't like traveling. I, I, when I was in high school, we traveled quite a bit. Uh, I didn't like that. I, I wasn't a big fan of being away from my friends and family for prolonged periods of time, uh, through the summer. And so, and again, if I don't, if I wouldn't do it myself, I don't want to ask my team members to do it. So we don't do so much residential or I mean so much state work. We do residential and then commercial slash industrial. All right. So on oil based, uh, yeah, winter's not a problem. It's not as temperature restricted as restricted as water. What you want to do is get you a moisture meter. Uh, Amazon, go on Amazon, literally search moisture meter. Uh, they're 25 or 30 bucks. And that'll let you know you want to be below, uh, below 15%. I believe you check with Caleb on that, but, uh, our number is 15%. Uh, it's either 13 or 15%, but uh, make sure you're below 15% and then you can go ahead and stain it. All right. Thank you, Erica. I appreciate it. Guys, I'm going to wrap this up. We ran a little bit long, but uh, I'm always I'm always happy to be helpful for you guys. Try to be as helpful as possible. If you had a question that didn't get answered, uh, you can drop it in the comments below and I'll bring it up next week or simply uh, hold on to it. And I'm, uh, you'll see a post from me in our communities tab. You can post it right in there next week, every Thursday from three to five 30, uh, central standards time here in the United States. I come um, we're going to do lives every Thursday. So I look forward to it. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys then. All right. A couple more. Let's see. Oh, no kidding. Eric Fountain's right here in the Ozarks too. Yeah. So we're out of Springfield. Uh, if you, if you like, if you like help on that, just let me know. I'd be happy to help you guys as much as possible. Jason, you're more than welcome. Guys, I appreciate you guys a lot. Uh, you guys have made the first weekly Ask Me Anything Q&A uh, incredibly successful, I feel like. So I want to say thank you to you guys for bringing great content. If you guys have a question, drop it in the comments below, and I'll bring it up next week. Or join me next week from 3 to 5.30 Central Standard Time. For now, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors.